In a hidden cave, Yi Yun, a young lad with black hair and striking golden eyes, lay battered on the ground, his face marked with bruises and his life hanging by a thread. Not long before, he had been relishing his college moments, filled with joy and anticipation as graduation loomed and everyone immersed themselves in a mix of play and study. Earlier in his dormitory, his companions had excitedly invited him on a climbing adventure, teasing him about the presence of some girls in the group. Yet, he found his attention drawn to a single girl. Eager to connect with the girl who held his affection, he decided to accompany his friends on the climbing excursion. During the train ride, he was thrilled to discover she was among the passengers, offering him a golden opportunity to engage her in conversation. As the climb unfolded, they engaged in lively discussions and reveled in each other's company. She even entrusted him with capturing photographs of her, a gesture that ignited hope within him that her interest might mirror his own. However, now confined to the cave and grappling with injuries, Yi Yun found himself contemplating the reasons behind his decision to embark on the climbing adventure. Amidst the pain, he realized that his primary motivation had been to prove his worth rather than a sincere desire to explore caves. Taking an unexpected twist, his focus shifted to a radiant amethyst resting nearby. To his astonishment, the moment he grasped the amethyst, his heartbeat surged, and the sensation of pain dissipated entirely. It was as though the crystal was assimilating his being, and in an instant, he disappeared from within the cave, leaving nothing but faint echoes of his presence. In a distinct realm characterized by mountains and rivers, a young girl named Jiang Xiaoru stood by her brother's grave. Wearing ragged garments, she was engulfed in inconsolable weeping due to the tragic loss of her sibling, Yi Yun. Meanwhile, within the confines of the tomb, Yi Yun, a lad possessing silver hair and deep yellow eyes, gradually regained consciousness, only to be confronted with the sensation of suffocation and the desperate struggle for breath. It dawned on him that he was confined, which prompted him to forcefully pound on the enclosure, his cries for assistance echoing through the air. Capturing the sound of her brother's voice, she sprang into action, determinedly excavating the grave using every ounce of her strength and employing any means at her disposal to rescue her cherished sibling. The moment the grave's confines were breached, Yi Yun drew in a deep lungful of air, replenishing his oxygen-starved system. With a picture of relief at his living presence, his sister hurried to embrace him, the tight hug a testament to her emotions, having believed she had been separated from him for good. While taken aback by the unexpected embrace, he endeavored to piece together the girl's identity and the reason for her unreserved display of affection. However, his surprise deepened when his words sounded unlike his previous voice, and he observed his hands, which were notably smaller than he remembered. Brimming with joy, she resolved to bring him home, yet their plans were swiftly disrupted by rustling sounds emanating from the jungle's depths behind them. Reacting swiftly, she snatched him, and they dashed away, concealing themselves behind a stout tree. Peering from their covert vantage point, they beheld a colossal beast reminiscent of a leopard, adorned with a bone mask upon its visage, and a human rider perched upon its back. While she was worried about his safety, Yi Yun's mind was a whirlwind of confusion as he struggled to comprehend the situation gradually entertaining the possibility that he might have traversed into another realm entirely. As they partook in a meal in their dwelling, she shared the heart-wrenching story of how he had been presumed dead after an accidental fall from a cliff during his herb-collecting venture. She had hastened to inter him, overwhelmed with sorrow, without ascertaining his fate. Providentially, the grave's emptiness had enabled his voice to reach her, leading to his eventual rescue. Witnessing his sister's tears, Yi Yun endeavored to offer solace and advised her to nourish herself. Yet she declined asserting that she had already consumed an adequate amount of food. A blend of gratitude and remorse surged within him as he observed the vacated food containers, realizing that his sister had been foregoing her sustenance to set aside some nourishment for him. He faked having a limited appetite to reciprocate her generosity, suggesting she take a portion of his food. Yet his astonishment grew when she maintained that she wasn't hungry. She elucidated that the following day marked the food distribution interval, during which she could secure a portion of meat to prepare a refreshing stew to aid his recovery. Beneath the night sky, Yi Yun's contemplation turned towards his sister's decade-long struggles caring for him, particularly during food scarcity. Their unwavering bond ignited a resolute determination to not let her slip away in this unfamiliar existence. To secure that future, he understood the imperative of becoming a formidable figure. Yet the path to achieving this remained unclear. Amidst these musings, his awareness shifted to the amethyst that had melded with his heart, absorbing starlight to replenish its vigor. Nevertheless, a nagging intuition hinted at a crucial complication linked to it. Meanwhile, Outside their dwelling, Xiao Ru was stationed by the fire, meticulously crafting arrows that would contribute to their sustenance. Engrossed in her task, her focus wavered when she observed him unintentionally stepping on one of the arrows, causing it to break. Worried for his well-being, she suggested he return to rest, cautioning him about the dampness that the night's dew could bring. However, his thoughts were consumed by her nighttime toil, prompting him to ask why she engaged in such laborious efforts during these hours. 
Puzzled by his lack of understanding, she clarified that this was a practice they had adhered to for numerous years. The arrows she painstakingly fashioned served as barter for food on the subsequent day, securing their nourishment and survival. While she gently pressed her hand to his forehead to check for any signs of fever, a mild sense of embarrassment tingled within him. He assured her that he was in good health, and together, they continued their arrow-making endeavor. During their work, he confided in her about his struggles to recall certain aspects of their world. He earnestly requested her assistance in comprehending their surroundings. Recognizing that encapsulating the entirety of their reality in one conversation was an immense task, she chose to commence with the topic of the arrows they were crafting. She elaborated that their realm was inhabited by martial artists of various affiliations both virtuous and malevolent. Human settlements, cities, and encampments were scattered across the land. In stark contrast, the untamed wilderness was teeming with formidable creatures and untamed beasts. Humanity confronted ceaseless peril from the feral creatures that roamed their world, whether they were engaged in agriculture or hunting endeavors. The wild beasts constituted an ever-present menace, curtailing human activities and confining them to restricted areas. Those who dwelled within encampments and cities found themselves particularly vulnerable and resource-scarce. Without the safeguard of formidable martial practitioners, the settlements were susceptible to obliteration by the marauding beasts in a single night. Xiao Ru's clan, the Lian tribe, was modestly sized and lacked warriors of high stature. Consequently, they teetered on the brink of extinction, their existence tenuous at best. Resources and sustenance remained scarce, and their ability to access them was severely limited. To navigate this harsh reality, they honed a specialized craft, fashioning weaponry for the larger tribes and cities, which also secured their place amidst the challenges of their world. The following day marked the arrival of the Huayun tribe to collect the arrows crafted by her people. She hoped that trading those arrow bundles could yield additional sustenance perhaps even a portion of wild game, which would greatly aid Yi Yun's recuperation. However, her expectations were dashed when the Huoyun tribe arrived with fewer supplies in exchange for more weapons than before, leaving the Lian tribe both disappointed and incensed. Suspicions arose among the Lian tribe, questioning the integrity of the Huoyun tribe and accusing them of underhanded dealings. Despite these allegations, the members of the Huoyun tribe remained reticent, offering no explanation and further exacerbating the already strained relations between the two clans. While she fretted over the limited food, his concern was directed at her exhaustion. He suggested that she retreat to rest, offering to handle the task of collecting provisions. Their conversation, however, was abruptly disrupted by the presence of an elder. Clad in a sinister mask, the elder struck his staff against the ground, sending a resounding signal that commanded silence throughout the area. With everyone's attention captured, he proceeded to order a change in the arrangement of food plates, followed by a directive to commence food collection. He pledged to explain at a later time. Among the onlookers was Wang Cheng, a robust and bald individual from their tribe who took charge of managing the warriors in the reserve camp, orchestrating their acquisition of sustenance in a hierarchical manner based on male family members' status. As Xiao Ru engaged in the plate exchange, the food distribution had already commenced, igniting her anxiety that she might not receive an adequate share this time. Amidst the ongoing food distribution, the stockpile of sacks steadily diminished, heightening her apprehension regarding whether they would secure a sufficient amount. At that moment, the elder issued a directive to Wang Cheng, urging him to bring forth the remaining grain stored in the tribe's granary. Consequently, all the members of the tribe were instructed to converge and participate in the grain collection process. Amid the prevailing desperation for sustenance, a frantic rush ensued toward the distribution stage, resulting in a chaotic stampede. However, Wang Cheng's authoritative voice resonated, commanding them to restore order and line up systematically. He cautioned that any breach of this order would entail consequences. Overwhelmed by the weight of his authority, the crowd obediently formed a line, initiating the process of swapping their wooden tokens for provisions. When the queue eventually led Xiao Ru to the exchange point, she surrendered two wooden tokens in exchange for grains. Her hopes plummeted, however, as she gazed at the meager amount of fine grains she received, a mere fraction of the usual allocation. Wang Cheng confronted her, insinuating that her family lacked male members, implying a reduced food necessity. Unperturbed by the insinuation, she took a resolute step forward, bringing Yi Yun to the forefront. With unwavering determination, she asserted him as their family's de facto male representative, offering a compelling rationale for their requirement for a larger food portion. Upon seeing Yi Yun's more delicate and diminutive appearance, the onlookers burst into laughter and taunts, asserting their ability to exemplify a real man. Their ridicule escalated to cruel remarks, insinuating that his recent demise rendered him feeble and fragile. Enraged by the scorn directed at her brother, Xiao Ru directly confronted Wang Cheng, whose irritation culminated in the raised threat of physical force against her. However, she had concealed an arrow in her attire, poised to defend herself. Yet Yi Yun stepped in before she could execute her intended retaliation, urging her to exercise restraint. Addressing Wang Cheng, 
he acknowledged the latter's physical prowess while cautioning against conflict with a young girl. His unexpected intercession further ignited Wang Cheng's ire, leaving her concerned for her brother's safety. However, Yi Yun assuaged her fears, and then surprisingly, he took a humble stance, bowing before Wang Cheng and apologizing on his sister's behalf. With courtesy, he reminded Wang Cheng that she had indeed provided two bundles of arrows, warranting a proportional share of food per the tribe's regulations. Wang Cheng's response was one of indignant assertions that his decrees were law, brushing off their predicament. Unyielding, Yi Yun persisted in advocating for equity. He proposed an adjustment of the rules that would benefit not only them, but also others facing similar circumstances. This audacious proposition ignited a flame of discontent among the other tribe members as well, leading them to demand an explanation for the inequitable distribution of food in exchange for their contributions. As tensions escalated and the assembled crowd showed no signs of being subdued, he endeavored to restore order by raising his voice, but his attempts proved futile. Just as the situation teetered on the brink of exacerbation, a resounding voice pierced through the tumultuous air, capturing the attention of all present. The voice asserted that it held the explanation needed. It belonged to none other than Lian Cheng Yu, the tribe's young master, a striking presence with his distinct purplish hair and the sword he bore. In the Lian tribe, Lian Cheng Yu stood out as the sole individual possessing the potential to ascend to the ranks of a purple blood warrior. His prowess earned him significant respect and admiration among the tribe members. Approaching Yi Yun, he commended the latter's maturity, recognizing that despite his youth, he exhibited a notable level of maturity and harbored the promise of remarkable accomplishments in the days ahead. Stepping closer to address the assembled crowd, Lian Cheng Yu's presence prompted many to appeal for his intervention, given their meager gains from the food exchange. With a gracious nod toward the elder, he assumed control of the situation. Moving confidently to the forefront, he took a step that caught everyone off guard. He bowed deeply offering a genuine apology for the struggles the tribe had faced in the past. His humility, even towards the lower-ranked members, left the assembled crowd in surprise and admiration. This show of humility didn't go unnoticed by all, including Yi Yun, who wondered if it was a calculated strategy to secure greater support from the people. However, Lian Cheng Yu promptly shifted his focus to address the pressing issue with the Hua Yun tribe. He summoned a group of men holding a container that bore the resemblance of a treasure chest. As they unveiled its contents, an entrancing crystal emanating a golden glow bathed the entire vicinity in its radiant light. Contained within the box was a bone that exuded a chilling aura, inducing shivers down the spines of those nearby. Lian Cheng Yu elucidated that the bone was a desolate bone, and the radiant golden light emitted by the crystal served to suppress its bone-deep coldness. He went on to disclose that the scarcity of food in the Lian tribe arose from their decision to allocate most of the weapons they crafted to procure the desolate bone. Amidst the mesmerized murmurs of the crowd, the aura of the desolate bone resonated with Yi Yun, leading him into an unexpected flashback. When Xiao Ru unveiled the intricacies of their world, she underscored the dual nature of wild beasts, not just perilous adversaries, but also repositories of riches. While their flesh could alleviate hunger, their hides and teeth fashioned into shields and weaponry, the apex of their worth resided within their bones. Through a specialized technique, the bones could be condensed into a desolate bone essence no larger than a soybean, the essence could catalyze breakthroughs in a warrior's progression, unblocking meridians, and awakening latent bloodline capabilities. Such a prize was the ultimate aspiration for every warrior, a treasure coveted throughout their lifetime. Amidst the present circumstances, Lian Cheng Yu stepped forth, addressing his fellow tribespeople and compelling them to contemplate their future. He drew a parallel between their tribe and the sands of a desert, emphasizing their fragility against the backdrop of looming destruction. Stirring emotions, he underscored the trials they endured, the pervasive fear that even their slumber could be interrupted by savage beasts. His impassioned words struck a chord, holding the audience in rapt attention. Then, unveiling a ray of hope, he announced a remarkable opportunity. Three months hence, the Tai A Divine Kingdom would initiate an expansive recruitment of young cultivators. Success in this selection could pave the way for them to ascend as warriors of the kingdom. While Lian Cheng Yu's compelling speech resonated with the gathered tribespeople, Yi Yun remained cautious about his underlying motives. He keenly perceived the driving force of ambition behind his words, even if it entailed jeopardizing the welfare of their tribe. Yi Yun was apprehensive that his relentless pursuit of a personal breakthrough could spell dire consequences, potentially costing numerous lives. It was clear that Lian Cheng Yu intended to exploit the desolate bone for his advancement, aiming to ascend to the ranks of a purple blood warrior within the next three months. With this newfound power, he believed he could seamlessly navigate the selection process securing a coveted place among the warriors of the esteemed Tai A Divine Kingdom. He assured the tribe that he could shield them and facilitate their relocation to the city's safety once he achieved this pinnacle. His appeal to the tribe was both passionate and practical. 
he implored the members to brace themselves for three months of austerity, embracing reduced clothing and food provisions. In exchange for their sacrifice, he pledged a reward beyond measure once his breakthrough was realized, and he transformed into a formidable warrior. Yi Yun astutely observed how he skillfully merged elements of fear and logic within his discourse, deftly manipulating the crowd's sentiments. To his astonishment, the entire tribe began chanting Lian Cheng Yu's name in unison, bowing reverently before him. This collective response even encompassed the elder members, all yearning for an improved future. Amid this spectacle, Yi Yun also noted the desolate bone emitting radiant beams of light, which seemed to be converging into his heart. While the luminous beams converged within him, an undercurrent of anxiety coursed through Yi Yun. He was acutely aware of the need to remain discreet about this mysterious occurrence. He reasoned that Lian Cheng Yu's innate curiosity would likely prompt an investigation, and if he were to stumble upon the anomaly surrounding him, it could potentially spell trouble. However, Xiao Ru wasn't oblivious to his distress. Noting his clammy forehead and cold hand, she inquired about his well-being with genuine concern. In a reassuring revelation, Yi Yun discerned that, just like Lian Cheng Yu, she couldn't perceive the luminous motes. This discovery led him to deduce that these glowing phenomena also remained hidden from others. Contemplating the amethyst's enigmatic nature, Yi Yun speculated whether he was the sole witness to the curious phenomena it brought forth. Just as he entertained the notion, Lian Cheng Yu materialized before them, offering a beast as sustenance. Lian Cheng Yu's assurance that they could always seek him out for more provisions carried a calming air. Sensing Yi Yun's unease, he extended comforting words, advising him to spare Xiao Ru from undue burdens, recognizing the challenge she faced in raising him. Yi Yun astutely detected the genuine warmth in Lian Cheng Yu's demeanor towards her, affirming his protective sentiment for her. The connection between the amethyst and the desolate bone abruptly ceased as the treasure box was sealed shut. Back at their residence, Yi Yun appeared lost in thought and inquired about Lian Cheng Yu from his sister. She exhibited a touch of unease and swiftly cautioned him that Lian Cheng Yu was far from virtuous, urging him to keep his distance. Yi Yun was prepared to elucidate his concerns regarding his character. Still, he was caught off guard by her preemptive awareness of his true disposition and her deliberate attempt to maintain a certain separation from him. In a light-hearted manner, Yi Yun playfully embraced his sister's advice, bowing down and receiving a gentle hit on his head as a response. However, their brief moment of levity was abruptly halted when he collapsed and lost consciousness. Overwhelmed by anxiety, she burst into tears, dreading the possibility of losing her brother again. Simultaneously, his body became immobilized, his movements slipping beyond his control. A suspicion arose that someone had orchestrated this situation, and his mind retraced Lian Cheng Yu's actions, concluding that he might be aiming to eliminate him. Despite the dire circumstances, he was determined to alert his sister about Lian Cheng Yu's intentions, though he sensed himself being pulled toward the precipice of death. His senses of sight and sound deserted him, yet he struggled. Unexpectedly, crimson tendrils of energy ensnared him and in the depths of his mind he directed a vehement curse toward Lian Cheng Yu. Amidst the crisis, Yi Yun realized that the red energy whips were Lian Cheng Yu's true essence. However, to his astonishment, the amethyst absorbed and transformed the energy into pure essence, tempering his second meridian and physical body. The process helped him eliminate impurities and cleanse his tendons, thanks to the three-tendon simple wash technique. Gradually, he regained consciousness and woke up from his life-threatening situation. Meanwhile, Wang Cheng was extorting the tribe members, forcing them to gather medicines for the young Lord Lian Cheng Yu's body-forging process. He tried to justify it as a blessing for them, but in reality, it was just a way to control and exploit them. Moreover, he threatened severe punishment if they failed to meet the demands. As Yi Yun and his sister were helping an injured woman from the tribe, he noticed them and interrupted their act of kindness. He demanded they hand over four more tales, adding to the already burdensome sixteen tales they were required to give. As they struggled to develop eight tales of herbs, Xiao Ru resisted his demand, questioning if he was trying to put their lives at risk. Wang Cheng, however, dismissed their concerns and continued to treat them and others poorly. Upon reaching Lian's clan medicine mountain, a place teeming with lush greenery and abundant herbs, Yi Yun skillfully climbed a cliff to get a better view. From below, she cautioned him not to overexert himself, considering his recent illness. Feeling confident in his recovery, he assured her he was fine and enjoyed the beautiful scenery from the cliff. After undergoing the three tendon wash, his body experienced a significant enhancement, making climbing the cliff feel as effortless as walking. He attributed this remarkable progress to Lian Cheng Yu's true essence, which had been absorbed by the amethyst, along with starlight and deserted bones. Realizing its incredible potential to absorb and transform various energies into pure energy, he concluded that it was no ordinary treasure. He saw it as a key to his stay in the current world, or possibly a means to return to Earth. Determined to unlock its secrets, he decided to conduct a thorough study of the mysterious amethyst in the future. 
As Yi Yun observed it, he noticed it absorbed the energy essence of medical herbs. He recalled that medicinal herbs' power consisted of a type of energy. In their world, warriors would consume these herbs to enhance their strength, as their bodies absorbed the medicinal power, refining it into energy. Curious about the amethyst's capabilities, he had previously experimented with various types of energy like frictional electricity, flame, and hot water. However, it showed no response to these sources, leading him to believe that the energy it absorbed was somehow related to martial arts training in this world. He was worried that the amethyst might have ruined the medicinal herb's original utility by absorbing their energy essence. Nevertheless, he put the herbs inside his bag, considering them merely good-looking dregs. However, a mischievous smile spread across his face as an idea struck him. He realized he could use this situation to his advantage and decided to absorb all the herbs on the mountain to teach Lian Cheng Yu a lesson and take revenge. Seated before the bag brimming with herbs, he assumed a meditative posture, allowing the amethyst to draw in every trace of energy they held. As the energy was assimilated, peculiar patterns of purple hue materialized on his skin, reminiscent of an Iron Man suit. Abruptly, he opened his eyes and punched into the air releasing a substantial burst of energy as an attack. Lost in absorbing the herbal energy, he momentarily overlooked his sister, who called out to him as he had been engrossed for an extended period. Perched on a precipice, overlooking clouds that could send shivers down the spine of even the bravest souls, they found themselves in awe. Her astonishment was palpable as she beheld the twenty tales worth of herbs he had gathered within just one hour, some of which were rare elixirs. Although he attributed his success to sheer luck, she proposed that they prolong their stay on the mountain, sensing that handing over the herbs too swiftly might arouse suspicion among the tribe. Intrigued about the warrior election of the Taiya Divine Kingdom, Yi Yun turned to Xiao Ru for insight. Noting his curiosity, she proceeded to elaborate. The kingdom was an ancient dynasty that ruled 108 states and 24 barbaric lands, with the Lian clan situated within one of these barbaric lands. She clarified that the warriors emerged from various states, and the initial selection was overseen by selectors dispatched to each tribe. The warrior selection process encompassed multiple elimination rounds, progressively weeding out the less skilled participants and eventually anointing the highest-ranking warrior as the national champion. Only the most exceptional contenders gained entry into the revered Divine Kingdom, where they gained access to national treasures and the coveted Tai A sacred technique. This selection was a rare opportunity for numerous tribes, both significant and minor, to transcend their humble origins and ascend to greatness. Continuing their conversation, Yi Yun inquired about the often-mentioned martial arts realms. She explained that the martial arts journey was boundless, commencing with the lowest realm, the mortal blood realm. This realm was subdivided into five levels, Valiant, Vigor, Thunderous, Meridians, and Qi gathering. Beyond the mortal blood realm lay the purple blood realm, considered the initial stage of martial art cultivation, as remnants of mortality still lingered from the previous realm. Progressing from the purple blood realm, one would encounter the Yuanji realm, followed by the Tao Seed Realm, the Enlightenment Realm, and finally, the Heavenly Realm. What existed beyond the Heavenly Realm remained a mystery, signifying the limitless nature of the martial arts path. Impressed by her wealth of knowledge, he was taken aback when she shared that her mother had provided her with comprehensive insights, and her elder sister had immersed herself in reading various anecdotes during her childhood. Curious about Lian Cheng Yu's ability to lead the clan to the city if he became a warrior, Yi Yun questioned further. She clarified that to guide the clan into the city, one had to be extraordinarily exceptional. Even if Lian Cheng Yu achieved that status, he wouldn't bother about them, as his demeanor was notably negative. With a determined expression, Yi Yun stated that while he lacked grand ambitions or the audacity to make solemn promises, he would exert his utmost efforts to ensure her happiness and shield her from hardships. Her face brightened, and she responded with a smile, affirming his words and expressing her willingness to await his actions. The following morning, with the symphony of birdsong echoing through the air, a sizable gathering of men was immersed in their rigorous training session. Yao Yuan, their instructor, a robust figure characterized by striking crystal blue eyes and a scar across his left eye, brought their training to a halt, clearly dissatisfied with their performance. Despite their focus on mastering the Dragon Tiger Fist, a fundamental martial art form from the Taiyan Kingdom, each technique within it comprised intricacies that demanded precision. He sternly reprimanded the disciples for blindly emulating the movements like mindless creatures, akin to monkeys imitating without any personal understanding. Meanwhile, Yi Yun maintained a safe distance, concealing himself amidst the foliage and observing their training. He held a firm conviction that to neutralize the looming danger posed by Lian Cheng Yu and succeed in the Taiyan selection, securing a tranquil existence for his sister, he had to significantly enhance his abilities for the challenges ahead. Even though the Amethyst possessed remarkable capabilities, it could only provide supplementary advantages. 
he realized he needed to acquire esoteric martial arts techniques to truly thrive in this world. Given his residence in a desolate region bereft of resources, his sole recourse was to clandestinely learn martial arts, secretly. While he was feeling bitter about his life's circumstances, cast into the role of an herb gatherer, Yao Yuan was engrossed in imparting a significant lesson to his pupils about the technique that was universally acquired by those within the realm of the Purple Blood stage, even including the nobility. Addressing his students with a beckoning gesture, he beckoned them to learn the technique he was about to discuss. During his explanation, Yao Yuan underlined the technique's value, emphasizing how it played a pivotal role in enhancing their overall physical attributes like their strength, tendons, bones, and each component of their bodies. This holistic approach would eventually contribute to their advancement up to the fifth stage of the blood realm. Demonstrating a horse stance as he spoke, the ground beneath his feet suddenly disintegrated, creating a dramatic effect. He elucidated that mastering the initial six techniques of the Dragon Tiger Fist could empower them to bear a weight of 500 kilograms. Furthermore, such mastery enabled them to deliver a decisive strike, capable of shattering even armor. Amidst this demonstration of astonishing strength by Yao Yuan, including Yi Yun, everyone stood agog, astounded by the sheer power on display. The collective sentiment was that this martial art was undeniably impressive. Some even considered the leader of the Taiyan Kingdom to be a savior as revealing such a formidable technique allowed the kingdom's residents to significantly amplify their might. In a parallel scene, Yao Yuan executed a punch that shattered a wooden dummy into splinters with a single strike. He elucidated that this feat resulted from mastering the Tiger Down the Mountain technique, a regimen designed to fortify muscles. The technique involved repetitive muscle training until it reached a state of enhanced strength and flexibility. A significant revelation followed. The mastery of this technique endowed a practitioner with the ability to generate sonic disturbances merely by wielding their fists. This resonated with such power that it could even disorient birds, causing them to plummet from the sky. Appropriately dubbed Fallen Angels Soaring Dragons, this technique became a testament to its immense might. Despite his earnest explanations, the gathered disciples struggled to fully grasp the knowledge he was imparting. He sighed and expressed his satisfaction, even if they could produce sounds using their muscles and bones. As the training was about to commence, Yi Yun harbored a resolute determination to keenly observe their techniques. His goal was clear. He aspired to pass the Taiyan selection and acquire the esteemed title of Royal Warrior. Driven by a sense of urgency to strengthen himself for the betterment of his sister's life, he also harbored a pressing need to safeguard himself from Lian Cheng Yu's murderous intent. While he had faith that the Amethyst could serve as his safeguard, his thoughts were interrupted when a plant branch inadvertently snapped under his touch. The resulting noise caught the attention of Yao Yuan, who promptly seized a substantial weight and hurled it in the direction of the sound. This projectile obliterated everything in its path, yet it unveiled no source of disturbance. Conversely, an odd crimson liquid underwent a rapid boil within an expansive cauldron crafted from bones. Several individuals were meticulously adding the herbs sourced by Wang Cheng from the members of the tribe into the cauldron. Once the herbs were amalgamated within the cauldron, the concoction was transferred into another receptacle, reserved for Lian Cheng Yu's use. Upon appraising the quality of the collected herbs, he commended Wang Cheng for his efforts. Wang Cheng, in turn, fabricated a falsehood that he had personally gathered the herbs, fortuitously stumbling upon rare specimens like Dan Guo and Black Fungus. Stripping himself of his attire, Lian Cheng Yu then directed him to assume the role of a guard, proceeding to enter the prepared container. As Lian Cheng Yu was immersed in his bath, those around him skillfully flattered him, asserting that only he could enhance his body through a heated bath. Unexpectedly, he began to sense something peculiar within the medicinal bath. Enraged by this observation, he sternly instructed his subordinates to intensify the heat. Despite the general apprehension that he might not withstand such elevated temperatures, Wang Cheng acted promptly, seizing logs from the surroundings and hurling them into the fire, further elevating the temperature. At the same time, Yi Yun engaged in his training regimen, demonstrating his ability to fall a tree with a single punch. Nonetheless, he wasn't content with his current strength. Recognizing that it was predominantly a display of raw power, rather than a refined tendon strength. Nevertheless, the significant infusion of medicinal energy that the amethyst had absorbed earlier was progressively integrated into his body through his practice, further honing his physical constitution. He was resolute in his understanding that, to effectively contend with Lian Cheng Yu, he needed to elevate his capabilities by mastering the dragon rib tiger bone fist, a fundamental technique suitable for purple blood cultivation. Meanwhile, Wang Cheng tirelessly fed wood into the fire to intensify the temperature. However, Lian Cheng Yu struggled to absorb the full benefits of the medicinal bath attributing his difficulties to a bottleneck in his progress. Despite this, his pride refused to concede defeat to this obstacle. Thus, he instructed his attendants to raise the temperature once again. This action left those around him surprised, as the heat was already at a level that a human could barely tolerate. Still, he demanded an even greater intensity of heat. Concurrently, Yi Yun was dedicatedly engaged in his training regimen, 
puncturing trees and shattering rocks and boulders with his mighty blows. While Lian Cheng Yu persisted in urging for heightened heat, Yi Yun relentlessly practiced, even though his fists were covered in blood and wounds. Astonishingly, despite the maximum temperature, Lian Cheng Yu's efforts failed, while Yi Yun succeeded by successfully advancing into the second level of the mortal blood realm. After five days, Lian Cheng Yu positioned himself next to the collected herbs, contemplating that his lack of progress must be attributed to a bottleneck rather than the quality of the medicines. Upon scrutinizing the herbs, he realized that the offerings from the tribe were subpar, and he promptly discarded all of them. He believed that his cultivation was lagging at a single level due to the inferior quality of herbs provided by the Lian tribe. On the other hand, the scions of affluent families received the finest medicines and most nourishing sustenance, allowing them to achieve better results. He lamented his circumstances, feeling unfortunate to have been born into a humble tribe. In his view, had he been born into the royal family of the Tai A Divine Kingdom, he could have already attained the Purple Blood Realm and stood a chance to vie for the kingdom's throne. In a fit of anger and frustration, he vented his emotions by smashing a nearby table, venting his discontent towards his family and the unjust fortune that had befallen him. The elder, Yao Mu, promptly rushed over, drawn by the commotion, and inquired about the cause of his distress. Learning of Lian Cheng Yu's cultivation difficulties, Yao Mu divulged that the mountain's medicinal resources were depleting making it impossible to sustain the refinement process for the desolate bones. Upon hearing this, Lian Cheng Yu's anxiety heightened, beads of sweat forming on his forehead. Swiftly turning to the elder, he urgently instructed him to assemble the robust men from the village, outlining his plan to set up a sizable cauldron that would allow them to initiate the refinement procedure without delay. Nevertheless, Yao Mu expressed some reservations, but Lian Cheng Yu reassured him, emphasizing the importance of success and the need to exhaust all options to prevent their clan's further decline. As he departed, he left Lian Cheng Yu with a reminder to keep their family and the benevolence of their clan in mind if he were to advance to the Dragon Gates. With newfound determination, Lian Cheng Yu enthusiastically summoned all able bodied men to gather, rallying them to prepare the cauldron for the refinement process. Meanwhile, at Yi Yun's dwelling, he remained deeply engrossed in his training regimen, methodically severing wood logs with his bare hands. His practice centered on the dragon rib tiger bone fist technique, which, when mastered, held the potential to slice through a stack of uniformly sized and evenly spaced wood pieces within a mere minute. As he converged with the other men from his tribe, concern weighed heavily on him, primarily due to the dwindling supply of materials caused by the exhaustion of medicinal resources from the mountain. His mind was preoccupied with procuring a fresh source of ingredients. Unexpectedly, Lian Cheng Yu's sudden appearance from behind caused him to startle. Yi Yun's presence took him aback, as he should have perished after Lian Cheng Yu had infused his true qi into him. This survival defied expectations and he contemplated whether it was linked to his bottleneck. Nonetheless, a smile adorned his face as he addressed Yi Yun, questioning why he was in the assembly. Yi Yun responded politely, revealing that he had come to participate in the desolate bone refinement attempt, partly enticed by the promise of daily meat rations for those selected. Unexpectedly, Lian Cheng Yu offered his support and encouraged him to venture inside instead of lingering on the periphery. A shred of hesitation still clung to him, stemming from the understanding that Wang Cheng rarely accepted individuals below the second class. However, his perception of him as an ambitious and capable individual led to an exceptional decision. He extended an opportunity to Yi Yun to participate in the refining process. Gratefully, Yi Yun accompanied him into the area designated for the refinement. Lian Cheng Yu advised him to give his best and not falter in his intentions. A sense of relief washed over Yi Yun, averting his imminent exposure. Yet, he couldn't shake his curiosity regarding Lian Cheng Yu's unexpected presence, given that he was supposed to be secluded in retreat for a month. Furthermore, the question lingered about why he was granted this participation, despite he had a long-standing murderous intent towards him. Lost in thought, he found Lian Cheng Yu urging him to follow quickly, prompting both of them to ascend the stairs. Navigating his residence, Yi Yun grappled with concern that Lian Cheng Yu could potentially be skeptical about his survival, considering the circumstances. Unexpectedly, Xiao Rou emerged from the house, urging him to present his hands. Initially shocked and hesitant, he was soon taken aback as she took matters into her own hands, conveying her awareness of his clandestine training. Deliberately, she unwound the bandages enveloping his hands, disclosing her knowledge of his nighttime training sessions and the frequent presence of bandages upon his return. Applying a gentle sprinkling of medicine onto his hands, she earnestly cautioned Yi Yun about the perils associated with delving into martial arts and enrolling in the monster bone refining activity, emphasizing that both ventures carried inherent risks to his well-being. Despite his attempts to clarify, she recognized that everyone harbored their hidden facets, and counseled him to maintain his secrecy. While acknowledging his transformation from his past, she steadfastly regarded him as a member of her family, an immutable truth. As she meticulously wrapped the bandages around his hands, 
she gently reiterated the importance of his presence during the monster bone refining and implored him to exercise caution throughout the procedure. Surprisingly, he found himself at the monster bone refining site, lost in thought, his mind drifting back to the interaction with his sister. Observing his distracted state, the instructor snapped him back to the present, reminding him that even with Leon Chung Yu's special permission, he still needed to put in diligent effort. Taking up the axe, his presence caused a stir among those around him, with his slight frame contrasting against the rugged backdrop of laborers. Criticizing his slender legs and branding him as a hindrance, they belittled him, and the instructor too held reservations, his entry being a result of Leon Chung Yu's request. However, he made it clear that his inclusion did little to alleviate the arduous task at hand. While Yi Yun went about cutting logs and feeding them into the fire, he pondered why he was allowed to partake in monster bone brewing. Yet, he understood that his intentions held little sway. His focus lay on seizing the chance to absorb the energy from the monster bone. If he could surpass Leon Chung Yu's strength, he believed he would acquire the power to defend against any forthcoming attacks from him. He swiftly engaged his crystal vision and observed a multitude of pure energies hovering around the container gradually being absorbed by the amethyst. Unlike his previous absorption from a distance, the proximity allowed him to sense the potency of the desolate bone's energy. He realized that the barren energy within the bone far exceeded what the herbs offered. Amidst this, he noticed some faint blue dots emanating from the bone. Intrigued, he speculated if these were also traces of the barren energy within the monster bone. However, these dots vanished mysteriously. His initial assumption was that these energies were being absorbed by the other men present, yet he soon realized that this couldn't be the case. He deduced that these energies weren't of the barren kind. As humans couldn't automatically absorb such energies, they required specific techniques for utilization. Remarkably, when he managed to break through to the second layer of the blood stage, he found himself capable of directing the amethyst's energy-absorbing ability. However, the nature of the blue dots remained elusive to him. Given the amethyst's capacity to absorb diverse energies, he decided to try absorbing the blue dots into his hands, which resulted in an icy sensation. This prompted Yi Yun to infer that the blue dots were likely harmful, as their aggression indicated. Yet, what amazed him even more was the amethyst's remarkable ability to effortlessly absorb even such aggressive, freezing poison, and convert it into pure energy to nourish his body. A sudden worry clouded his expression, as he pondered why others didn't seem to experience anything, despite their bodies absorbing the same blue dots. Given that his physique surpassed those around him, he found it implausible that they would be more cold-resistant than him. This led him to conclude that the issue was with their perception. Perhaps their senses were too blunt to detect the cold. Regardless, he harbored concern that the frigid poison could stealthily amass within their bodies, culminating in dire consequences. Yi Yun deduced that Lian Cheng Yu allowed him into the desolate bone refinement process to lead him toward his doom. However, he now intended to consume all of the desolate bone's energy, leaving nothing for Lian Cheng Yu's designs. Once the desolate bone refinement was completed, he returned to the training grounds testing his newfound strength. Surprisingly, it took several days for him to fully absorb the essence of the desolate bones, a process that propelled him into breaking through the third level of the mortal blood realm. This accomplishment only intensified his determination to harness the essence from the desolate bones, aiming to ascend to the fifth level of the mortal blood realm as swiftly as possible. After concluding his training, he returned to his village, where he was met with a large congregation. He approached an elderly woman for information, and she shared that the clan leader was distributing elixirs. The woman explained that everyone who had participated in the bone refinement process had contracted typhoid fever, suffering from symptoms like coughing, high fever, and vomiting, leaving them in a state resembling near death. Yi Yun was taken aback, but he recognized that the cold poison was now showing its effects. Amidst the gathering, conversations buzzed about the red elixirs that were being distributed to the patients, evidently granting them newfound strength. Everyone present seemed to envy their fortunate comrades, especially because those who received the elixirs were also given cured meats as compensation. In contrast, Yi Yun pondered the source of these red elixirs. Given the clan's prolonged financial struggles, it struck him as odd that they suddenly possessed such a valuable resource. Moreover, if such elixirs were available, it was more likely they would have been reserved for someone like Lian Cheng Yu rather than the less fortunate members of the clan. These circumstances led him to suspect that Lian Cheng Yu might be using the situation to extract the poison from the bones through the lives of the strong men. In response, he resolved to prepare himself for what might lie ahead. Sometime later, Xiao Ru approached Wang Cheng, requesting a red elixir for her brother. Wang Cheng, however, scornfully remarked that Yi Yun used to be tough but was now confined to his bed, insinuating that his end was near. Despite this grim outlook, he noted that Lian Cheng Yu was surprisingly generous, and thus, he decided to give an elixir to Yi Yun. As the elixir was presented, a chaotic scene ensued, with everyone clamoring for a share. 
He intervened with a shout, warning them to desist if they wanted to receive any elixirs. Amidst this commotion, he handed an elixir to Xiao Ru but paused midway, choosing to extend his personal condolences to her brother. Back in his home, Yi Yun lay on his bed, his strength diminished, and he rose when he saw Wang Cheng. Wang Cheng handed him the elixir, mentioning his luck due to Lian Cheng Yu's benevolence. Upon receiving the elixir, Yi Yun swallowed it, aided by his sister, who brought him water, cautioning him to drink slowly. Given his weakened state, Wang Cheng made a condescending remark about his poverty and instructed him to resume work once he recuperated. After he departed, Yi Yun discreetly spat the elixir onto a cloth, confirming his suspicions that it was poison. The poison appeared to stimulate a person's latent abilities to combat the cold poison from the desolate bones. While those who took the pills seemed to recover, their lifespans were drastically shortened. This revelation incensed Yi Yun because many were being sacrificed to refine the bones, all for the sake of Lian Cheng Yu's cultivation advancement. Out of the blue, Xiao Ru inquired why they were putting on an act, and if there was an issue with the elixirs provided by Lian Cheng Yu. While he acknowledged that something was amiss, he hinted that someone might be orchestrating this drama intentionally. During this time, Lian Cheng Yu was engrossed in his training, while Wang Cheng attempted to flatter him by asserting that he was undoubtedly destined to emerge as the victor in the competition for the position of the Tai A Divine Kingdom's national warrior. Yet this flattery appeared to have little effect on him, prompting him to inquire about his purpose for visiting. Although he assured that all was proceeding as usual and that the less fortunate clan members were content after receiving meat and medicine, Lian Cheng Yu focused on Yi Yun. While Lian Cheng Yu sipped water, Wang Cheng disclosed that Yi Yun had fallen severely ill and suffered from diarrhea a few days ago. He described him as drenched in sweat with a pungent odor permeating the room, highlighting the gravity of the situation that Yi Yun might have succumbed without the timely delivery of elixirs. Although Wang Cheng observed him consuming the elixir closely, he still possessed a semblance of conscience, expressing gratitude for Lian Cheng Yu's assistance. With a sense of relief, Lian Cheng Yu instructed him to keep a vigilant eye on Yi Yun. Given that they were nearing the culmination of their efforts, Lian Cheng Yu stressed the importance of flawless execution in the desolate bones refining process. He further enticed him with promises of rewards if the refinement proved successful. However, in the event of failure, Wang Cheng was acutely aware that his life would be at stake. Fearing the dire consequences, he humbly knelt down before Lian Cheng Yu, offering unequivocal assurance that he would ensure every detail was attended to with the utmost care and precision. In the village, Yi Yun engaged in a conversation with Aunt Wang. Their discussion revolved around Lian Cheng Yu and his benevolent act of aiding others' recovery by distributing red elixirs. Her family had desired to partake in the desolate bones refining process, recognizing the potential fortune it held, but circumstances prevented them from doing so. Surprisingly, he produced a piece of meat and offered it to them. However, both Aunt Wang and her granddaughter declined the offer. Despite their existence in an impoverished and underdeveloped clan, their concern for others remained steadfast even as their own family struggled with starvation. Their selflessness deeply impressed him, and he reminded them of Xiao Ru's potential fate had it not been for their intervention. Though they attempted to dissuade him, he offered them the meat and hurriedly departed, citing his lateness for the impending desolate bones refinement session. Fifteen days passed, and Yi Yun positioned himself beside a waterfall. Engaged in his practice of Tiger Descends technique, he sent the mountainside into a frenzy of dust due to his vigorous punches. His movements triggered thunders in the skies, and even drew arcs of surprise rainbow hues. These signs indicated that he had mastered the ability Yao Yuan referred to as the Tendon's power, enabling him to easily employ it. During the past fortnight, he followed covert lessons during the daytime while harnessing the bone's potency during the night. His hours were spent practicing diligently until the break of dawn. His prowess skyrocketed considerably, and he managed to thoroughly consolidate his realms. Filled with confidence in his newfound strength, he resolved to attempt opening his channels and progressing into the fourth meridian realm. Deep in contemplation, he gazed upon the sky and the waterfall, encircled by faint yellow energy orbs resembling fireflies. The time had come for him to initiate the process of opening his meridians and ascending to the fourth realm. Every individual possessed meridians, yet those of common people remained obstructed, hindering the accommodation of energy from the cosmos. Once a warrior completed their martial arts training, the subsequent challenge was to clear their meridians, marking the commencement of their journey on the martial artist's path. In a human's body, Twelve regular meridians and eight special meridians composed their channels. Among these, each limb and hand hosted three regular meridians, totaling six primary ones. The eight special meridians spread throughout the body, with the Ren and Du veins being the most significant among them. A crucial element was the presence of broken meridians between the two, which, when energy infiltrated the body, would naturally mend, forming a continuous energy circuit. As a result, these two meridians held the key to unlocking all meridians in the body and ultimately charting the path of a martial artist. Thankfully, 
Yi Yun's meridians were in good condition, allowing him to progress unhindered. The dragon rib tiger bone fist played a pivotal role in enabling him to unblock his meridians. Otherwise, progress after absorbing the desolate bones would have been impossible. Seated meditatively, he brought his palms together, creating a sphere beneath them. Inhaling the energies of the heavens and the earth, he simultaneously absorbed the essence of the sun and the moon from his surroundings, while a subtle radiance emanated from the amethyst at his side. Though he encountered some struggle and tension during this process, the available energy was insufficient due to the low density of the heaven and earth energies. Determined, he initiated the process anew, gathering and condensing the qi after meticulously controlling its flow. However, as he pushed his limits, his efforts began to take a toll, evidenced by blood trickling from his mouth, yet he remained resolute, unleashing an immense surge of energy from within him. The surrounding area was suddenly illuminated, and the force of his energy even annihilated the trees in its immediate vicinity. Despite his evident injuries and difficulty in movement, Yi Yun spat out a considerable amount of blood and removed his clothing. Slowly making his way towards a nearby pond, he entered its waters for a cleansing bath. Emerging from the pond a while later, he resolved to assess the extent of his newfound strength. Closing his eyes, he sensed the light of the fourth level within him, and upon opening his eyes, he could discern through the vision of the fourth level. Confirming that the energy in his body had naturally condensed, he couldn't help but express his satisfaction, as he had successfully attained the fourth level of the mortal blood realm. The next morning, the entire village congregated around a raised wooden platform, where Lian Cheng Yu stood alongside the elder, Yao Mu. To everyone's surprise, a massive black leopard-like creature was also present, along with a man wielding a lengthy sword. Yi Yun recognized this man as the one he had evaded when he first transmigrated into this world. Turning to his sister, he inquired whether she knew him. She disclosed that the individual was Zhang Yuxian, a prominent figure in the Taiya Divine Kingdom, their top-tier instructor. Furthermore, he had been appointed as the examiner for the elimination round of the Taiya Divine Kingdom's election. Although he had encountered Zhang Yuxian twice, he remained puzzled as to why an elite member of the Golden Dragon Guard would remain in the desolation of the Cloud Wilderness. Meanwhile, Yao Mu conversed with Zhang Yuxian regarding a vision that had eluded the Elder's sight, despite his long-term residency. Zhang Yuxian explained that significant events unfolded in the wilderness, unrelated to the Lian clan, and advised them to avoid offending the various influential figures who could occasionally traverse their domain. Turning his attention to the gathered crowd, he introduced himself and disclosed his plan to select 30 young individuals under the age of 28 as his temporary disciples. His stay in the village was slated for a few days, during which he would impart techniques applicable to the Tai A Divine Kingdom's election. From the group of selected disciples, participants for the election would be chosen by Zhang Yuxian himself, and any individual not chosen would be disqualified from the election. Amid his call for the participants to assemble in a line, chaos ensued as eager warriors rushed to organize themselves. Lian Cheng Yu stepped forward, suggesting that since everyone was already gathered, he might as well assess the crowd. He also expressed his desire to become one of Zhang Yuxian's followers, seeking his guidance. Learning that Lian Cheng Yu was on the brink of reaching the Purple Blood Realm, Zhang Yuxian commended his achievement, especially considering his humble birth in a barren land, and permitted him to remain. He cast his eyes over the warriors once again, finding their assembly unsatisfactory, and shifted his attention to the Lian clan workers, inquiring if any among them wished to partake in the kingdom's selection process. The assembled crowd appeared weak and fatigued, as if they had been enduring hardship and had gone without sustenance for days. Lian Cheng Yu explained that all the martial arts practitioners of the clan were already present, while the rest were commoners who engaged in laborious tasks and lacked combat skills. Unexpectedly, Yi Yun stepped forward, taking everyone by surprise, including his sister. Wang Cheng's face flushed with anger as he questioned his actions, but he remained fearless, asserting that he had come to enroll. Amid the tension and surprise in the air, a palpable intensity grew between Yi Yun and Lian Cheng Yu, as their gazes locked onto each other. Amid the gathering, Lian Cheng Yu confronted him, sternly ordering him not to cause trouble and to leave. However, he boldly responded, brushing aside the threat. He believed that survival in the wilderness required strength or one would inevitably become subservient to stronger ones. Being labeled as a slave didn't bother him, as he acknowledged his own weakness and challenged Lian Cheng Yu, asserting that even Lian Cheng Yu himself would become a slave if he encountered someone more powerful. Lian Cheng Yu seethed with anger at being mocked by someone he considered insignificant, but he suppressed his outrage in front of the crowd, choosing to remain silent. Zhang Yuxian found his perspective intriguing, recognizing a rare depth of thought in the wilds. He concurred with Yi Yun's assertion that the weak often ended up in servitude even admitting that he too would become a slave if he encountered someone mightier. Intrigued by his unconventional mindset, Zhang Yuxian invited him to stay, recognizing that Yi Yun had now proven himself qualified for his training. Walking toward the assembly of other warriors, Wang Cheng mocked him, suggesting that he would appear foolish standing among them. In the midst of this, 
Zhang Yuxian approached one of the warriors in the group, placing his hand on the warrior's shoulder. A peculiar blue light emanated from the warrior as he infused him with his Yuan Qi. However, the warrior absorbed only a mere 10% of the energy, highlighting the relatively poor innate qualities of those from the cloud wilderness. He moved on to the next warrior, explaining that the previous individual possessed a regular constitution, unsuited for martial arts. As time progressed, he swiftly evaluated and eliminated half of the warriors within just a quarter of an hour. Among the group, only Lian Cheng Yu earned the praise of very good. On the flip side, Xiao Ru was filled with concern for her brother. However, Yi Yun reassured her that things would turn out all right. Wang Cheng, who was positioned nearby, jumped into the conversation and belittled Yi Yun, asserting that he was weaker than even a stray doga, and went on to jest that Zhang Yuxian would probably pick a stray dog over Yi Yun. In response, he retorted, advising Wang Cheng to focus on his own affairs. As the exchange heated up, every warrior present became agitated, yet their reactions were swiftly stilled when Zhang Yuxian unexpectedly emerged. Wang Cheng was left panting and visibly anxious as he announced that he had barely made the cut, thus passing him. Soon, it was Yi Yun's turn. He stood unwavering, displaying no signs of hesitation and exuding profound self-assurance in his abilities. While Lian Cheng Yu wore a smile, anticipating the humiliation that he assumed Yi Yun would face, Zhang Yuxian found himself unable to discern Yi Yun's level, suspecting that he was deliberately concealing his true talents. He posed a query to him, asking whether he had ever engaged in martial arts practice. Yi Yun confirmed this fact, but Wang Cheng interjected, asserting he was lying. He claimed to have personally verified that he hadn't practiced anything. Narrowing his gaze, Yi Yun directed his attention to Wang Cheng, questioning how he could be so certain about his lack of martial arts practice. He then disclosed that he frequently traversed the tribe's grounds, observing Yao Yuan's demonstrations while practicing on his own. In response to his revelation, a wave of laughter rippled through the gathered warriors. They found it hard to believe that someone like Yi Yun, just a child, could have learned the intricate fist technique merely by observing it from a distance, especially when they struggled to grasp it themselves. Unexpectedly, Zhang Yuxian infused his Yuan Qi into Yi Yun, only to be taken aback when every bit of his Yuan Qi was swiftly absorbed. Unbeknownst to him, Yi Yun possessed the exceedingly rare amethyst, which had the capacity to absorb Yuan Qi. Filled with a sudden thrill, he commended Yi Yun as excellent and unveiled him as a prodigy in martial arts, bearing a seamless body. This revelation sent shockwaves through the crowd, leaving everyone, including his sister Xiao Ru, astounded. He explained that possessing a seamless body marked Yi Yun as a martial arts prodigy. He clarified that even if he remained a low-level purple blood warrior, his unique attribute would make him highly esteemed even in prominent tribes. While he acknowledged that the Amethyst truly deserved the accolades, to avoid raising suspicions, he decided to accept the title of prodigy. All eyes were fixed on a single figure, Yi Yun, whose unexpected praise astonished everyone, given the general disbelief that he could be a martial arts prodigy. At the same time, Lian Cheng Yu's surprise mirrored the crowd's sentiment, as the revelation about his seamless body and prodigious martial skills caught him off guard. Wang Cheng, visibly shocked and fearful, couldn't help but question Zhang Yuxian's assertion, wondering if the designation of martial arts genius for Yi Yun was a misunderstanding. Under the weight of a palpable pressure, Zhang Yuxian retorted to his skepticism, questioning whether he doubted his judgment. Then, addressing the assembled onlookers, he disclosed that their worthiness for selection was debatable. However, owing to their humble origins in a remote and impoverished area, he expressed a degree of compassion and reluctantly accepted them. He emphasized that his time was limited and instructed the chosen warriors to convene in the afternoon, as they would face training intensified twofold. As he prepared to depart, Yao Mu kindly mentioned that dinner was prepared and invited Zhang Yuxian to stay. Without hesitation, Zhang Yuxian leaped onto his massive beast and declined the offer, explaining his urgency to leave. With a swift exit, he left the gathering and the opportunity for a shared meal behind. In his wake, animosity towards Yi Yun grew among the onlookers, who struggled to reconcile the notion of his talent. They couldn't fathom that Yi Yun, whom they perceived as incapable of even catching a chicken, could be labeled a martial arts prodigy. Wang Cheng seized the chance to taunt him, but he shot back, humorously asking if he was ready to dine on a tree. He turned to the others, posing the same query about consuming stones and drinking from the river. Respectfully, Yi Yun approached Lian Cheng Yu, requesting leave from refining the desolate bones to focus on martial arts practice. Though a trace of tension seemed to cross Lian Cheng Yu's demeanor, possibly triggered by a tinge of jealousy, he ultimately acquiesced granting him the requested leave. As the day transitioned to evening, Yi Yun found himself back at home with his sister. Seizing the moment, he inquired about the concept of a seamless body. Xiao Ru, his sister, explained that a seamless body prevented energy from escaping, making it an optimal physique for martial arts training. She elaborated that while maintaining a leak-free state was possible in the mortal blood realm, things changed once one entered the purple blood realm. Amazed by her depth of knowledge, 
He probed into the origins of her understanding. She revealed that she was regarded as a prodigy during her youth and stumbled upon some information. She described that testing for a seamless body was intricate and time-consuming, and due to Zhang Yuxian's restricted cultivation, he had opted for a more straightforward approach. Furthermore, she highlighted the rarity and high value attributed to a high-level, leak-free body, even among the prominent clans. Unexpectedly, Xiao Ru disclosed a family secret involving a cousin who possessed a seamless body. The news had led to a joyous family celebration that lasted several days. Even though her recollection of the event was somewhat hazy due to its occurrence during her younger years, she mentioned that distinguished individuals had graced the occasion with their presence to offer their congratulations. Hearing about her past, Yi Yun couldn't help but consider that her background was more intricate than he had thought. He pondered over how she ended up in the vast wilderness and came to be adopted by their family. Abruptly, the conversation shifted and she shifted her attention to a cautionary note. She emphasized that Lian Cheng Yu could not handle sharing the limelight well, and might resort to harmful measures if Yi Yun garnered too much attention. She further pointed out that Zheng Yuxian's presence within the clan was temporary, and he couldn't indefinitely guarantee Yi Yun's safety. Therefore, she advised him to maintain humility moving forward. As he contemplated her insights and depth of knowledge about the world, she kindly offered him a set of clothes she had crafted herself. Gratefully accepting the gift, he couldn't help but wonder about how much effort and time she had invested in making the fabric. She shared that the clothing was originally intended as his New Year's Eve present. Still, given his training starting that day and the occasion's significance, she believed he should be dressed elegantly. Touched by his sister's profound affection, he found his eyes brimming with tears and quickly changed into the new attire she had given him. Later in their conversation, she inquired about his dinner preferences and advised him to wear the clothes exclusively during his training sessions. The following day, Yi Yun headed to the training grounds, where Wang Cheng and his companions were in the midst of their training. As he appeared, Wang Cheng set aside the heavyweights, hefty enough to crack the ground he had been using, and approached him with his group. They mockingly referred to him as the prodigy, and questioned whether he had come to test his strength with his supposedly fragile body that couldn't even lift a four-paged stone lock. Abruptly, Yi Yun pointed out the imminent arrival of Zhang Yuxian. In response, they immediately became alert resuming their training with renewed focus. They were all absorbed in their routines by engaging in a series of push-ups and other exercises. However, Zheng Yuxian's arrival brought a new level of seriousness to the scene. Calling them idiots, he expressed dissatisfaction, emphasizing that he could not witness their display akin to monkeys. He employed a chop attack on a tree to showcase his prowess, effortlessly cleaving it in half and leaving everyone astonished. Observing this display of power, beads of sweat formed on their foreheads. Realizing that Zhang Yuxian could cut a tree with his bare hands, a tree heavier than himself, he clarified that he wouldn't impart traditional kung fu or martial arts techniques. Instead, he would teach a classified technique known only within the Jin Long Wei, the art of military suspension. This revelation sparked a range of emotions among the participants, a blend of excitement and apprehension. Despite the difficulty associated with learning the technique, their eagerness was palpable. To illustrate this unique technique, he summoned Wang Cheng to the forefront. Surprised yet pleased by the opportunity, Wang Cheng moved swiftly to the designated spot, standing there with a mixture of astonishment and anticipation. Zhang Yuxian directed his attention toward the substantial acacia tree he had cut previously and instructed him to eat it. Caught off guard by the unusual command, Wang Cheng turned towards the tree, only to stop abruptly as the absurdity of the instruction registered in his mind. Despite his inner turmoil, the order still hung in the air, and his fear grew palpable causing his body to tremble. However, Zhang Yuxian and Lian Cheng Yu insisted he proceed with the seemingly impossible task. Faced with little choice, he reluctantly approached the tree and, with a sense of resignation, picked up a piece of the tree, putting it into his mouth. Curious about this unconventional technique, Lian Cheng Yu politely inquired about its nature. Zhang Yuxian disclosed that it was the elephant swallowing technique, a practice designed to enhance both the stomach's capacity and digestive abilities. Legend had it that those who mastered this technique to its highest level could even consume entire cows or wild beasts in a single meal. This disclosure triggered a sense of skepticism among the other warriors, causing them to question the utility and charisma of such a skill. Upon hearing these doubts, Zhang Yuxian's anger flared, and he cautioned them against underestimating the military techniques of Jin Long Wei based on their limited knowledge. He went on to explain that cultivation formed the bedrock of a martial artist's journey, and neglecting the development of their stomach would lead to woeful cultivation outcomes. He emphasized that a skilled martial artist could extract the utmost benefit from their nourishment, thereby underscoring the importance of a well-trained stomach. Yi Yun resonated with his explanation, as he understood the potential efficiency of converting food into energy for the cultivation of mortal blood warriors. 
a strong stomach and a hearty appetite could significantly amplify the effectiveness of their cultivation. Zhang Yuxian further stressed that a robust stomach enabled seamless energy absorption, preventing the squandering of valuable resources. Amid this discourse, Lian Chengyu had already devised a plan. He intended to employ the elephant swallowing technique, following the completion of the bone's refinement, aiming to expedite his breakthrough to a higher realm. As Wang Cheng proceeded to eat the tree, Zhang Yuxian pointed toward him and elucidated to the gathered warriors that mastering this technique could safeguard against famine. The ability to consume tree bark and grass roots could potentially sustain them during times of scarcity. He informed them that their dietary regimen was transforming from that day onward, comprising items like tree roots, tree bark, and guanyin clay. This sudden shift in their diet left everyone astonished and somewhat apprehensive. He instructed them to practice the elephant swallowing technique after consuming their meal that would aid in effectively digesting the nutrients from their unconventional diet. Although met with reluctance and hesitation, Yi Yun stepped forward, moving toward the tree Wang Cheng was eating from. He squatted down, picked up a piece of the tree, and started consuming it. Throughout this act, Zhang Yuxian scrutinized him closely. While partaking in this seemingly odd practice and under the watchful eye of Zhang Yuxian, Yi Yun contemplated the world he now inhabited. In a realm governed by the principles of social Darwinism and marked by unpredictability and aggression, survival was intricately tied to strength, yet he was resolute in his decision not to be bound by these harsh rules of existence. A tense atmosphere settled among the warriors as they watched his fervent attempts to consume entire trees. His determination seemed to both awe and terrify them. Lian Cheng Yu's voice cut through the unease, referring to them as fools and questioning if they were even fit to be considered adults let alone warriors, and commanded them to adhere to Zhang Yuxian's instructions. While the warriors harbored a degree of reluctance, they found themselves with no alternative but to comply. Reluctantly, they approached the trees. Wang Cheng's frustration with Yi Yun's heroics was palpable, predicting that he would be the first to falter. Others joined in on the criticism, although they acknowledged that they aimed to gradually improve and prove themselves comparable to him. However, Zhang Yuxian's revelation shattered their tentative optimism. He disclosed that mastering the elephant-swallowing technique wasn't a straightforward endeavor. He shared that many individuals had perished after ingesting tree bark without gaining any benefit from the practice. This grim disclosure left the aspiring learners profoundly unsettled. He further emphasized that pursuing martial arts was far from a mere jest, as every martial artist had to comprehend the lurking mortal danger, and only by pushing oneself to one's limits could one achieve a breakthrough. The path of martial arts was a journey into the unknown, encompassing the conquest of inner demons, evading death's grasp, and surmounting harrowing ordeals. Within this path, the specter of death, was always present. With a touch of scorn, Zhang Yuxian mocked them, proclaiming that if they couldn't even eat tree bark, they were unworthy of delving into martial arts and might as well perish in the wilderness. While expounding these lessons, Yi Yun tirelessly continued devouring tree bark. This sight frustrated Wang Cheng, who, driven by a mix of annoyance and determination, also began gnawing on the tree bark and declared that he feared nothing, not even trees. After a while, the warriors consumed most of the available tree bark, filling their stomachs to the brim with the fibrous material. However, including Yi Yun, they found themselves immobilized, brought down to their knees due to the sudden stomach ache brought on by their excessive eating. Suddenly, Zhang Yuxian approached the group and instructed them to perform the twelve movements he was about to demonstrate. Taking his stance, he formed a circle with his hands, from which a blue, emerald-like wheel emerged. He swiftly executed a series of movements, generating afterimages that converged back into his original position. Having showcased the twelve movements of the elephant swallowing technique, he encouraged the warriors to try them. Successfully mastering these movements, he assured, would set them on the right path to practicing the elephant swallowing technique without facing difficulties in digesting the plant material. The technique shocked everyone as they had never imagined that the elephant swallowing technique involved specific movements. The fact that they couldn't perceive anything but the afterimages further surprised them. Wang Cheng raised his hand, questioning the consequences if they could not master the movements. To their astonishment, he replied that the only result would be having to exert more effort in the restroom implying digestive troubles. In a desperate attempt, many began poking their mouths, hoping to trigger vomiting and eliminate the excess plant material. Unexpectedly, Lian Cheng Yu stepped forward, eager to try the movements. Assuming the stance and successfully executing the actions, he was immediately showered with praise, dubbed amazing and even godlike by his peers. However, Zheng Yuxian merely remarked that it was just acceptable. Their attention shifted to Yi Yun, who was already prepared to attempt the movements. While recognizing his potential, Lian Cheng Yu was skeptical about his ability to execute the technique. The elephant swallowing technique relied on a precise sequence of subtle movements to stimulate the stomach's function, but Lian Cheng Yu's understanding was superficial. As Yi Yun focused, he pondered that fixing solely on the magic could distort the movements and believed finding a balance was the key. 
With this in mind, he enacted the elephant swallowing technique exactly as demonstrated by Zhang Yuxian. Watching him, Zhang Yuxian displayed surprise, sensing a hint of the technique's essence in his execution, despite having only demonstrated it once. He was taken aback, finding it hard to believe that such a young individual possessed such an exceptional level of comprehension. Meanwhile, the other warriors were astonished by the technique he displayed, and speculated that he might be on the same level as Lian Cheng Yu, or even stronger. In contrast, Lian Cheng Yu was visibly shaken with anger, his jealousy flaring as he realized that a young individual like Yi Yun had surpassed him. Yi Yun perspired profusely during practice as a powerful heat surged within his abdomen. To his revelation, the elephant swallowing technique had the unique ability to collect qi and blood. This newfound understanding dawned upon him. Utilizing the elephant swallowing technique, he could even assimilate glass and iron nails. Witnessing his impressive performance, Lian Cheng Yu swiftly adopted a shrewd facade of friendliness. He openly admitted being convinced of his exceptional talent and regretted doubting him earlier. In addition, he lamented that channeling Yi Yun's abilities into gathering herbs on the mountain was a squandering of his potential. He astutely recommended him to join the preparatory camp, emphasizing that the clan's newfound priority was to nurture his abilities. Lian Cheng Yu further assured him that upon becoming a warrior of the kingdom, he would assist him in escaping the wilderness, envisioning a future where the two of them would elevate their clan's status. Recognizing this as an act in front of Zhang Yuxian, Yi Yun played along reciprocating with gratitude and agreeableness. Right after that, Lian Cheng Yu asked Zhang Yuxian to showcase the technique again. In response, he performed the elephant-swallowing technique at a reduced pace, enabling everyone to observe and grasp it. However, the following day, he became irritated upon seeing the trainees exhausted, struggling, and collapsed on the ground. Filled with anger, he struck the pillar vigorously, experiencing a sense of humiliation. Nevertheless, Wang Chung stepped in to clarify that the previous night they had spent the entire time in the cottage training for their lives. He knelt with others, appealing for leniency on their behalf. Suddenly, Lian Cheng Yu intervened with harsh words, criticizing them and labeling them as a group of ineffectual individuals. Nonetheless, Zhang Yuxian stepped in, halting him, and proposed him to practice with Yi Yun. Additionally, he granted permission for the others to engage in their usual practice. Upon Yi Yun's arrival, Lian Cheng Yu urged him to display proper conduct in the presence of Zhang Yuxian, and Yi Yun agreed to this request. During that very night, Zhang Yuxian peacefully enjoyed the moon's beauty and while gazing at a piece of jade, he abruptly entered his abode. He penned a letter there announcing his sudden departure, and swiftly left the sect. The subsequent day, Lian Cheng Yu announced his sudden departure, and fabricated a story, asserting that he left some pills specifically for Yi Yun. Furthermore, Lian Cheng Yu requested a private meeting with him. During this confidential conversation, he proposed a plan wherein they would share the pills as if they were brothers, which was met with gratitude from Yi Yun towards Zhang Yuxian and Lian Cheng Yu. However, his demeanor soon shifted as he began manipulating Yi Yun. He insinuated that the pills might have intense effects on him, implying that he would provide the pills only after he completed the bone refining process. Lian Cheng Yu also promised assistance in enhancing his strength. In response, he feigned gratitude and bowed to Lian Cheng Yu. He emphasized that his actions were motivated by the clan's future and advised Yi Yun that repaying the clan's people was equally crucial. Subsequently, he tasked him with overseeing the boiling of the desert bones. Unbeknownst to him, Lian Cheng Yu harbored ulterior motives, aiming to bring about his demise. There were also suspicions surrounding the nature of the pills. Following that, complying with his instructions, Yi Yun departed from the location. En route, he contemplated the prospect of consuming the valuable desolated bone. Observing him falling into his orchestrated scheme, Lian Cheng Yu perceived him as naive, foolishly proud, and unknowingly marching toward his demise. He regarded investing power and effort in a feeble person like Yi Yun as futile. Approaching the bone refining area, Yi Yun encountered a man attempting to provoke him by asserting that his absence for several days had effectively sealed his fate. However, he paid no heed and strived determinedly towards the bone. Having abstained from replenishing his energy for days, he experienced a profound hunger for power. Recognizing Lian Cheng Yu's impatience and realizing he had limited time, he understood the urgency of achieving a breakthrough swiftly. Upon initiating energy absorption from the bone, his entire being radiated a luminous glow, and he sensed an overwhelming surge of energy coursing through his body. Yet, upon assimilating the entirety of the energy in one go, he collapsed to the ground, blood trickling from his nose and mouth. Bereft of energy and sprawled on the ground, he appeared to be in a state of depletion, leading bystanders to assume that he was on the brink of death. Consequently, they resolved to inform Lian Cheng Yu of the situation. Yi Yun found himself in immense anguish, grappling with the implications of what had occurred to his eyes. His eyes remained wide open, yet his vision was progressively becoming obscured. At this juncture, an individual attempted to inspect him, but his hands suffered a burn upon touching him. Upon carefully repositioning him, 
it was revealed that his eyes were glaring open, radiating a red glow, and he was experiencing bleeding from his eyes, nose, and mouth. This eerie sight led them to believe he might be possessed, instilling fear that prompted their retreat. Meanwhile, the energy he had absorbed was scorching through Yi Yun's meridians. He grappled with whether his mental state or the amethyst's influence was causing the turmoil. It felt akin to his body being on the verge of eruption, and he began to assume he was on a certain path to death once Lian Cheng Yu arrived. Despite the excruciating circumstances, he summoned all the strength to stand and resolved to depart from that place. Walking in his blood-stained clothes, bystanders opted to leave him to his fate, assuming that he was already in the throes of dying. On the other hand, Wang Cheng conveyed to Lian Cheng Yu the pleasant information about Yi Yun's apparent possession, accompanied by bleeding throughout his body potentially culminating in his demise. Lian Cheng Yu's countenance twisted into a malevolent grin, an expression of perverse delight upon learning this news. Wang Cheng suggested disposing of Yi Yun's body by feeding it to dogs to vent their hatred. However, Lian Cheng Yu swiftly reprimanded this notion by delivering a sharp slap to his head, rejecting the proposal because of the anticipated repercussions from Zhang Yuxian upon his return. Acknowledging his error, he offered his apologies for the ill-conceived suggestion. Subsequently, Lian Cheng Yu commanded him to retrieve Yi Yun, driven by his sinister desire to witness his demise firsthand. Additionally, he tasked Wang Cheng with notifying Xiao Rou that he wished to discuss a matter of importance. In contrast, Yi Yun's mobility had been severely compromised. His ability to walk was reduced to a mere struggle, and his vision deteriorated to the point of blindness. His eyes were a tumultuous blend of light and blood, yet he remained oblivious that he was unknowingly headed toward a river. On the flip side, Xiao Ru was engaged in her tasks with a sense of tranquility. However, her sense of calm was abruptly shattered as Wang Cheng arrived with an unsettling grin and imparted the distressing news that Yi Yun was both possessed and experiencing pervasive bleeding. This shocking revelation prompted her to abandon her duties, flinging aside her belongings as tears streamed down her face. She hastened to locate Yi Yun, her path illuminated by traces of his blood. Ultimately, she located him yet he steadily advanced towards a river's edge. She urgently called out from behind, pleading for him to halt and prevent himself from falling into the water. However, he seemed disconnected from reality, and despite her warnings, he lost his footing and was swept away by the powerful river current. Concurrently, Wang Cheng noticed that she was perilously close to sharing the same fate and swiftly intervened, preventing her from tumbling into the river, thus averting a potential tragedy. Wang Cheng instructed her to remain there, assuring her they would search for Yi Yun's body. Despite her inconsolable grief and repeated calls for Yi Yun, she continued calling out his name. Amidst this turmoil, Wang Cheng couldn't help but ponder the grim possibilities of Lian Cheng Yu's intentions towards her. Meanwhile, Lian Cheng Yu stood alone within the clan's mausoleum, clutching a violet crystal. Abruptly, Wang Cheng rushed to the scene, his breath labored from his sprint. Sensing his approach, Lian Cheng Yu quickly concealed the purple crystal beneath his clothing. Upon arrival, he shared the news that the village had been thrown into disarray due to the frost phenomenon rendering them too fearful to assist in searching for Yi Yun's body. Surprisingly, he grew incensed at Wang Cheng for invading the sanctity of the clan's tomb solely to deliver the information. Wang Cheng, recognizing his folly, humbled himself and pleaded for forgiveness and his decision. Yielding to his plea, he ordered him to propagate the news of Yi Yun's demise. Wang Cheng grasped the intricacies of the strategy and expressed his appreciation even expressing a sense of satisfaction at the prospect of Yi Yun's sister becoming obligated to serve Lian Cheng Yu. Meanwhile, his countenance twisted into a sinister grin as he acknowledged Wang Cheng's eloquent articulation. However, the ambiance took an unforeseen turn as a vivid purple luminescence swept through the surroundings, and Wang Cheng was expelled from the confines of the clan's tomb, visibly beaten up. Following this, Lian Cheng Yu was consumed by fury as he conversed vehemently with his parents' resting place vowing to avenge their deaths. He acknowledged that the path ahead would be arduous and demanding, yet his determination remained unwavering. Meanwhile, Wang Cheng emerged from the clan's tomb, bearing the unmistakable signs of a physical altercation. Witnessing his condition, Yao Yuan was taken aback, astonished that Wang Cheng had dared to venture into the clan's tomb in search of Lian Cheng Yu. In close succession, Lian Cheng Yu was mildly irritated by Yao Yuan's arrival. He expressed his intention to discuss something with him, only to be preempted by him, who declared that Yi Yun's remains had vanished without a trace. He highlighted the inconsistency with his parents' manner of passing, and suggested that if a burial were arranged for Yi Yun, the coffin would inevitably hold an empty vessel. However, Yao Yuan's frustration peaked, prompting him to express that a decade had passed since Yao Mu's loss of his two benefactors. Since then, he had disregarded the welfare of the villagers. He asserted that the responsibility for Lian Cheng Yu's advancement came at the cost of dozens of villagers' lives, 
which he attributed to his parents. Yao Yuan argued that because of his jealousy, Yi Yun had met his demise, his sister had been taken captive, yet all the responsibility and shame laid upon Li and Cheng Yu's parents. To his astonishment, he divulged an unexpected revelation and disclosed that during the beast catastrophe ten years prior, Yao Yuan had been present near the Lian clan's vicinity. Lian Cheng Yu, along with his parents, had valiantly confronted the beast. Still, in a tragic turn of events, his parents sacrificed themselves to ensure his survival, as they were devoured by the creature, leaving no trace of their remains. Regrettably, Yao Yuan remained unaware of Lian Cheng Yu's whereabouts during that fateful period. Yao Yuan, visibly agitated and perspiring, implored him to provide a comprehensive account of the situation. Responding to this, he proceeded to debunk what he deemed as ludicrous, his association with the wilderness people and the exhibition of the purple crystal. He elucidated that the beast incident had been orchestrated for the sake of a singular individual. Only those who had undergone the process of refining desolate bones managed to escape the calamity. Still reeling from the revelations, Yao Yuan was insistent on learning the complete details of the events that transpired a decade prior. Abruptly, Lian Cheng Yu directed his attention to a celestial phenomenon in the sky. Accompanied by a formidable surge of beasts, he cryptically mentioned the emergence of a sovereign figure and the imminent rise of their tribe's supremacy. His eerie smile returned as he disclosed his intention to obliterate all desolate tribes worldwide, commencing with his very own clan, and concluded with a sinister laugh before departing from the scene. Disheartened by the spectacle, Yao Yuan realized that the inept Yao Mao could no longer control his grandson. Gazing up at the moon overhead, he contemplated the unfolding turmoil. As it turned out, Yi Yun managed to survive the fall and found himself in the depths of the East River. Curiously, the impact from the fall seemed to have momentarily numbed his body's pain receptors. He contemplated whether the earlier sensation of bright light was simply an instinctive reaction. Abruptly, a surge of pain coursed through him, a reminder that the energy was still coursing within him. In response, he chose to submerge himself even deeper into the water. Although the water pressure intensified as he descended, he found an odd comfort in it. Interestingly, he noticed that he no longer required the act of breathing, as the energy he absorbed directly nourished his cells. Amidst the unique situation, Yi Yun found himself uncertain about his next course of action. Whether to focus on refining his physique, perhaps engaging in sets of the dragon tendon and tiger bone fist, or attempt the elephant swallowing technique once more, considering its potential for accelerating energy absorption. However, he acknowledged the counteractive effect of the intense water pressure on the energy flow. Perhaps incorporating weight training could be a solution to consider in this underwater environment. Nevertheless, the gentle current of the water enveloped him in a sense of comfort, prompting him to close his eyes. Unexpectedly, a series of vivid flashbacks inundated his mind. Images of Xiao Ru enduring torment at the hands of Wang Cheng, her tearful pleas for his assistance echoing in his memory. The amethyst embedded within him instantly began to emit a radiant glow. An unsettling sensation emanated from his chest, alerting him that his emotions were intertwining with the energy coursing through his body. It became apparent that his intense emotions triggered a response from the amethyst within him. Determined to harness the newfound understanding, he recognized the need to gain mastery over his emotions and utilize this energy surge for a breakthrough. He was resolute in his goal to protect Xiao Ru and become a shield for her. To achieve this, he resolved to eliminate all distractions and commit himself fully to the guidance provided by his body and the enigmatic power of the amethyst. He found himself illuminated by the wisdom of Tao, the essence of nature, and the tranquil embrace of the water's flow, which all contributed to a deep sense of comfort. However, even as Yi Yun embraced the newfound comfort within the water, he made a pivotal decision. He discerned the most fitting course of action, yet despite his choice, it remained evident that the dragon tendon and elephant swallowing techniques harbored their limitations. His survival, through the ethereal water and ethereal spirit, was a testament to the instrumental role played by the amethyst. It enabled him to withstand an ordeal that only a select few could endure. Through this journey, Yi Yun ascended to mastery in the dragon dance accessible to only a privileged few. It was a realm where forms ceased to bind, emptiness held no sway, and self dissolved into the infinite expanse. Meanwhile, situated along the riverbank, a diminutive figure with feet resembling those of an animal issued orders to Lin Xin Tong. She was a captivating young woman with flowing hair and striking purple eyes. He directed her, stating that the moment had arrived to proceed with the next phase. He instructed her to eliminate the sixth grade monster within a mere fifteen minutes. Commencing her task, she focused her energy, conjuring an array she launched into the air. The array took effect swiftly, engulfing the sixth grade creature in flames, but the beast's demise was gradual, prompting her to make another attempt. Employing a series of intricate mudras, a yellow radiance manifested, igniting the remaining bones in a fiery blaze. A talisman was hurled towards the array, leaving only a small fragment of bone intact. Despite her discontent with the outcome, 
she was reassured by her teacher's appreciation. He acknowledged her ability to accomplish the feat within the specified 15-minute time frame and hailed her as the most exceptional barren shaman of her age. He offered counsel, advising her not to be hasty and to first secure the bone relic. Furthermore, he divulged his concerns regarding her yin veins, noting that her lifespan was restricted due to this unique condition. She required firebone relics to unblock her obstructed veins and maximize her latent talent to counteract this limitation. However, as per the ancient tales, there were whispers of an empress who managed to break the shackles of the curse by sacrificing her chi veins and undergoing a hidden transformation. Clues were scarce, and neither he nor the Lin family knew about the mysterious event. He inhaled deeply. His curiosity peaked as he queried their plan. Her response served as solace, assuring him that her family had extended her lifespan through bone relics despite her inherent yin veins. In comparison to the average individual, she considered herself fortunate. With a sense of tranquility, she inquired whether their journey to the barren lands was related to the Taiyan selection. He acknowledged that their purpose extended beyond her training and suggested they continue walking as he recounted their purpose. He ventured further, questioning her awareness of the occurrences within the barren lands during the past months. Swiftly, he divulged that there had been two instances of purple clouds during that time, but the situation had taken a peculiar turn two months prior. The clouds engulfed the land, leading to disturbances in the qi energy and even causing a reaction among the barren monsters. Thus, during the forthcoming Taiyan selection, three potential scenarios could unfold from these peculiar phenomena. The first involved the possibility of a treasure emerging, while the second entailed the occurrence of calamity. The difficulty lay in the absence of corresponding indications within the treasure compass, or evidence of such catastrophic events within the barren lands. This led to the third and remaining hypothesis, an unverified rumor. That was precisely why he brought her along. As he unveiled this information, she registered surprise, and questioned if he had orchestrated this for her sake. In response, he urged her to quicken her pace, driven by his hunger. He mentioned their planned rest stop at the Tao tribe after passing through the Lian tribe. Unexpectedly, his attention was arrested by the sight of Yi Yun's prone form in the water, triggering a moment of shock as he feared that he might be drowning. Simultaneously, Yi Yun, in an unconscious state, was also gripped by a sensation of hunger. In a swift motion, Lin Shintong seized him by his garments, hauling him out of the water. When his eyes fluttered open, the first visage that greeted his gaze was that of her, yet he remained perched at the river's edge, his gaze interlocked with Lin Shintong's. In an abrupt turn of events, he succumbed to vomiting, much to her observant eyes. Upon tidying himself, he inquired about their identities, prompting her to counter with a query of her own, why he was floating on the river and whether he was in danger of drowning. He opted to withhold the truth about his underwater cultivation, wary of revealing the amethyst abilities. Instead, he extended gratitude for their timely intervention. Intriguingly, the teacher perceived Yi Yun as both young and shrewd. With a keen gaze, he studied him, delving deeper by analyzing his pulse and the residues of his cultivation expelled during the vomiting episode. Consequently, he deduced that Yi Yun had not been drowning, which prompted him to wonder whether the teacher possessed an awakened third eye or the ability to perceive the amethyst's essence. The teacher, however, dismissed any interest in his enigma, expressing skepticism about an emperor-like figure involving himself in the affairs of someone as destitute as him. Curiosity lingered, leading the teacher to question how a humble youth from the barren lands had managed to attain the qi guidance stage. This revelation provoked Yi Yun to question why he remained entrapped at his current stage despite successfully absorbing a monster bone. Adding to his observations, the teacher noted that his veins exhibited remarkable clarity and were akin to dragon veins. He praised the potency of his blood and acknowledged the precision of his cultivation. Nonetheless, he wondered why these attributes manifested in a young lad from humble origins. This observation sparked a flicker of excitement in Lin Shintong, who sought confirmation whether he was suggesting Yi Yun possessed an impeccably cultivated physique. He affirmed this yet underscored the rarity of such a phenomenon given Yi Yun's origin. Amidst this exchange, Yi Yun engaged in his calculations. The circumstances did not warrant suspicion, as these individuals navigated the barren lands with a casual ease that betrayed their non-ordinary status. Seizing the moment, the teacher divulged that possessing an impeccably cultivated body remained uncommon even at the Qi guidance stage. While Yi Yun's potential was deemed average, he ventured to speculate that he might have inadvertently absorbed a valuable treasure, subsequently tumbling into the water and advancing to his current stage. Upon receiving his astute deduction, Yi Yun found himself utterly taken aback. Inquiring whether the explanation had been accurate, the teacher conveyed his sense of fortune in meeting him. Mired in contemplation, he grappled with his thoughts. Unexpectedly, the teacher extended a handful of coins, whimsically referring to them as candies. This unforeseen frugality astonished Yi Yun, yet he recognized the value of even meager bronze coins to someone of his modest circumstances. As he deliberated on the future and the plight of Sister Xiaoru, Yi Yun contemplated a course of action. An idea dawned upon him. 
Perhaps Lin Xin Tong and the teacher could aid him in thwarting Lian Cheng Yu. Venturing the proposal, he inquired if they were inclined to stay at the Lian tribe. But the teacher promptly declined, disclosing their imminent journey toward the Tao tribe. Observing Yi Yun's drenched state, the teacher advised Lin Xin Tong to procure sustenance, as they had expended ample time in their current location. Noticing that Yi Yun was also in need of nourishment and warmth, he extended the invitation to him as well. Realizing that their path would inevitably lead them to dine in the Lian tribe eventually, he perceived this as an opportune moment. He consented to accompany them, urging them to lead the way. After a short while, they settled down to eat. However, the teacher appeared somewhat displeased with the notion of sharing a meal, contrasting with Yi Yun's musings that the chicken before them must be far from ordinary. Detecting his contemplation, he asked whether he had encountered a genuine chicken before. Courteously, Yi Yun responded that he had presumed individuals of an immortal caliber like him did not need sustenance. This remark struck him like an unexpected boulder, inciting an emotional outburst as he vehemently retorted that the act was not labeled as eating, but rather as cultivation. After a momentary cooling of tempers, he resumed cooking, while remarking that Yi Yun was incredibly fortunate to be among those privileged enough to savor his culinary prowess. He might even attain enlightenment through the experience in a stroke of luck. Yet, Yi Yun grew weary of the discourse as he continued expounding on this topic. After preparing the meal, he presented a charred piece to Lin Xin Tong, suggesting that Yi Yun cook his portion. However, Yi Yun was at a loss when it came to culinary skills, yet he seized upon this as an opportunity to seek assistance from him. Contemplating the options, he hit upon the idea of preparing salt-baked chicken. To bring his plan to fruition, he requested a bottle of wine from the teacher, who found this proposition intriguing. He consented and handed Yi Yun the wine, despite Lin Xintong's reservations about allowing a youngster to consume alcohol. His focus remained on him, urging him not to squander the wine if he was unfamiliar with cooking. While Yi Yun continued his culinary endeavors, she suggested that he moderate his alcohol intake. But his attention remained fixed on Yi Yun. As Yi Yun seasoned the chicken with salt, his ire escalated, and he exclaimed at the seemingly excessive amount of salt being used. He queried if Yi Yun intended to harm himself by consuming such a salty dish. Following a brief wait, Yi Yun returned with the cooked chicken, prompting astonishment from both Lin Xintong and the teacher upon witnessing the impeccably prepared dish. His fascination was palpable as he fixated on the delectable chicken while Yi Yun, unperturbed, commenced his meal in their presence. Seizing an opportunity to jest, he playfully offered a piece of chicken to Lin Xintong, subtly teasing the teacher. The teacher's longing for the dish was evident, and he even proposed himself as a quality tester for the chicken. As Yi Yun momentarily turned away, engrossed in eating, he was taken aback upon his return to find that the teacher had devoured the entire chicken. The unexpected sight left him in a state of shock. Surprisingly, even after consuming the whole chicken, he remarked that he had nearly caught up to the black charred chicken, inquiring about its name without delay. Following a pause, he extended a sum of money to Yi Yun as an offering. However, Yi Yun politely declined the gesture and proceeded to divulge the dish's name, Fate Pheasant. The name resonated with his thoughts, prompting him to inquire about Yi Yun's true intentions. Met with a momentary silence, he posed the question once more, urging him to be forthright. Eventually, he broke the silence, acknowledging that he recognized the teacher's exceptional status and understood he was no ordinary individual. As he brushed aside any flattery, Yi Yun asserted that he was sincere and forthright in his words. He broached the topic with unguarded candor, expressing that survival in the expansive wilderness hinged on achieving comparable strength. With a surge of courage, he requested that the teacher bestow upon him the gift of strength. In response, the teacher inquired whether he aspired to become his disciple. However, Yi Yun harbored apprehensions that his meager bone structure would disqualify him from such a position. On the other hand, he acknowledged his unique strength and resilience, yet conceded that his frail bones posed a limitation for him to be taken on as a disciple, an assessment to which Yi Yun assented. He elucidated the scarcity of resources within the cultivation world, pointing out that the valuable assets were predominantly held within aristocratic families, often coupled with innate talent. Given his less than robust bones, he would require a consumption rate ten or even a hundred times greater than that of the average practitioner. Yet this demanding path held no guarantee of achieving the pinnacle of mastery. Pondering this, Yi Yun couldn't help but contrast his potential with that of the less talented Lian Cheng Yu, who had managed to attain the Purple Blood Realm. Digging deeper, he probed Yi Yun's rationale for not participating in the selection process, given his intelligence and the assurance of a stable livelihood if he succeeded. Guarding his secret weapon, the Amethyst, Yi Yun refrained from disclosing his true motivations. Instead, he articulated that his intention wasn't to seek an apprenticeship, but rather to request guidance on cultivation materials. In response, the teacher's demeanor incensed, admonishing him to maintain decorum and not overstep his bounds. Lin Xintong interjected, inquiring why it would be problematic to provide Yi Yun with some materials, considering the high praise he had previously offered. 
Her question further fueled his ire as he vehemently conveyed that she had no clue of the exorbitant cost associated with the materials, particularly for those without the backing of a powerful family. Adding to his argument, he highlighted that Yi Yun lacked a suitable training environment, rendering the provision of materials wasteful. Acknowledging his limitations regarding innate talent, Yi Yun concurred that he might not possess the necessary aptitude. However, he pointed out his partial familiarity with the dragon rib tiger bone fist technique. Uncertain of its quality, he queried if that skill might suffice. In response, the teacher's frustration escalated upon learning that Yi Yun already had a master, chastising him for audaciously proposing to be taken on as his disciple. He clarified his situation, explaining that he had been misunderstood as he didn't have a master, but he acquired his skills by surreptitiously observing others in the tribal school. Despite his explanation, he regarded Yi Yun's assertions with skepticism. He directed Lin Shintong to demonstrate the extent of her prowess, suggesting she show Yi Yun how high the sky could be. She sought clarification on the meaning behind this phrase, prompting the teacher to elucidate that she could engage in a sparring match with him using the first set of techniques from the third cultivation level of the Purple Blood Realm. Following this, he outlined the terms for Yi Yun. If he could withstand her techniques, he would consider accepting him as his disciple. He offered him three preemptive moves, and if he could persevere, he would be deemed successful. However, Lin Shintong interjected, requesting the teacher not to mock him. She revealed, that she had been diligently practicing the technique for six months. In response, he thanked the teacher, anticipating the opportunity in advance. The teacher then cautioned her, advising her to ensure they didn't have to cover any medical expenses. In response, Yi Yun generously voiced that he came specifically for a lesson with her, expressing his gratitude for her guidance. She reassured him that it wasn't a concern, and introduced herself. After a brief interlude, she declared the initiation of her first move. Suppressing her realm's strength, she allowed Yi Yun to take the lead. However, Yi Yun opted for her to initiate the attack, as he was unsure how to begin a fight. Responding to his request, she poised herself to strike, issuing a caution to him to exercise caution, as blows and kicks could be unpredictable. In an unexpected twist, just as she was on the verge of striking, a veil of smoke enveloped the scene, obscuring their vision. As the haze gradually dissipated, Lin Xintong stood on solid ground, while Yi Yun was suspended high in the sky. The lack of hiding spots in midair left him vulnerable prompting her to launch another attack, but he was prepared and ready to retaliate. During their exchange of blows, he sensed that time slowed when he was fully focused. So he thought to introduce an unexpected element. When she transformed her open palm into a fist, he planned to counter it by using his claws to break her palm. As she launched her palm strike, he attempted to grasp and break it, but despite his efforts, he struggled and eventually lost his balance, resulting in a fall. The teacher observed this with a perspective that she was perhaps too lenient in her approach. Amid the exchange, a feather wafted to the ground, catching his attention. Simultaneously, Yi Yun found himself tumbling into a waterfall, and as he emerged from the water, he reflected on his lack of experience, which had led to his setback. He realized he needed to strategize more intelligently, knowing that if Lin Shintong changed her tactics to target his palm, his hand would be at risk. Guided by the belief that martial artists should leave no reservations, he impulsively leaped into the water. From her vantage point in the air, she attentively observed his movements. Summoning the technique of the water dragon's dance, he conjured a water dragon reminiscent of the mighty Shenron, which he directed toward her as an attack. Initially, her response was one of astonishment, however. She quickly apologized and resumed her defense. Initiating her technique, she conjured an aura and rendered him immobilized by merely skimming the water around Yi Yun. Swiftly after that, her attack propelled him backward again. Meanwhile, the teacher was nearing the completion of roasting the chicken, yet the splashing water broke his concentration. In a loud exclamation, he warned Yi Yun against tampering with water, particularly water ghosts. In the midst of this, a stunning rainbow materialized in the sky. On the other hand, Yi Yun lay on the ground, nursing injuries. Despite unleashing his full power at the opportune moment and location, he found himself defeated. Nevertheless, a smile crept onto his face, prompted by the realization of his burgeoning strength. Subsequently, Lin Shintong approached and assured him that she would provide him with medicine, tend to the fire and launder his clothes as a gesture of compensation. Upon hearing her considerate offer, he found her both intimidating and remarkably beautiful. Her goddess-like aura made him inclined to revere her, prompting him to decline her help with the medicine and assert that he would manage it on his own. As she appeared to discuss his technique, she altered her words, noting that the final move he had executed was not the dragon rib tiger bone fist. This revelation left the teacher astounded, and she disclosed that Yi Yun's victory was attributed to the application of the Fairy Maiden Heart Sutra in the concluding moments of their match. Amidst his lingering bewilderment, the teacher's demeanor shifted to disappointment. Subsequently, he posed a question, inquiring why she who had triumphed through the heart block was being so modest. Amidst the light-hearted atmosphere, Yi Yun joined in with laughter. Taking the opportunity, he interjected by bowing respectfully and admitting his defeat. Nevertheless, she countered, 
asserting that it was her breach of the rules that led to the outcome. The teacher in agreement confirmed Yi Yun's victory. Responding to their exchange, he modestly stated that he wasn't exceptionally skilled and expressed gratitude for the treasure at stake. Following this, she presented him with a book titled The Dragon Rib Tiger Bone Fist, but he hesitated, refraining from accepting the book as it wasn't part of their initial arrangement. However, she gently placed the book in his hands, affirming that he deserved it more than she did. Grateful for the gesture, Yi Yun extended his thanks. Meanwhile, the teacher contemplated his loss, recognizing that the book could have been sold for a substantial sum. Additionally, he instructed Yi Yun to retrieve his belongings from him. Next, he presented a large skull, which piqued Yi Yun's curiosity. Upon inquiry, he disclosed that it was the remains of a Qilin beast. She supplemented the explanation by noting that while the beast was physically frail, its desolate bones held a remarkable power and traced its lineage back to the ancient fire Qilin bloodline. Further elaborating, she delved into the reason behind the creature's demise. In a bid to awaken their dormant bloodline, some Qilin beasts used to seek out fire-type spirits to consume, hoping to achieve a form of rebirth through self-immolation. Unfortunately, the pursuit of rejuvenation often led to their untimely deaths. Witnessing the premature fate of the beast, Yi Yun was filled with a sense of wonder. Contemplating the situation, he pondered whether a life well-lived but cut short was preferable to a long but uneventful existence. Amidst this, he couldn't help but speculate that Lin Xintong was using the story of the Qi Lin beast to offer him either encouragement or a warning about recklessly chasing after fleeting desires, like a moth drawn to a flame. Seizing the opportunity, the teacher stepped in, acknowledging that while Yi Yun possessed enlightenment and fortune, his physical constitution was fragile. Thus, he advised him to tread carefully, curb overconfidence, and avoid becoming lost in recklessness. Grateful for the guidance, Yi Yun expressed his gratitude. Prompted by this exchange, the teacher revealed that the Qi Lin beast, which perished from the flames, could gradually release its vitality without requiring heat, enough for him to use it for ten years. Following this disclosure, he gifted him a Taoist amulet that might one day save his life. He mused that this token might be the connection that would reunite them in the future if fate allowed. As the amulet was handed to him, Yi Yun inquired about the teacher's name. However, he found the name Su Jia inscribed on the amulet paper, and with gratitude, Yi Yun bowed in appreciation for his kindness. He also pledged not to intrude further upon his time at this juncture. But this declaration inadvertently upset him. This was due to Yi Yun's unmentioned promise to cook for him, a promise that now conflicted with his desire to depart. After some time passed, beneath the canopy of the night sky, Su Jie and Lin Xintong cooked a meal. He openly admitted that it was a significant loss, but in the end, they had relieved Yi Yun of a burden. She inquired whether he held a high opinion of Yi Yun, but he refuted that notion. Instead, he confessed to admiring his qualities. Despite this, Su Jie saw little hope for his progression to the next level. And even if he managed to exit the wilderness, he could not escape the bounds of the Taiya Divine Kingdom within his lifetime. He imparted his advice to Lin Xintong, urging her not to concern herself with him any longer. However, she persisted, questioning whether they would encounter him again. This query caught Su Jie off guard, causing him to react with a sense of panic, and he went so far as to inquire if she harbored romantic feelings for Yi Yun. Lin Xintong, though, requested his patience as she revealed a profound experience. She disclosed a subtle change within her body when their hands had briefly touched, stemming from her dead pulse. Taken aback, he disclosed the cause of the purple cloud and urged her to expedite their journey. He had already set plans in motion, entrusting the leader of the Jinlong Way to gather information and arrange a meeting at the Tao clan. Lin Xintong, however, remained persistent in her queries about Yi Yun. Understanding her curiosity, Su Jie advised against rash decisions, emphasizing that the matter required a more comprehensive discussion. He also expressed his belief that Yi Yun would inevitably participate in the election, and if he did not appear, he declared his intent to bring him to the event himself. Meanwhile, Lian Cheng Yu and Yao Mu were engaged in a conversation within their chamber. Yao Mu lauded him for his adept handling of the situation, highlighting that the tribe's future rested on his capabilities. But Lian Cheng Yu dismissed this praise, attributing it to flattery. Yao Mu then delved into the challenges they faced regarding the deceased individual. He commended his strategic intelligence for diverting blame towards the child's family making them scapegoats. Their discussion was abruptly interrupted by Wang Cheng, who entered the room in distress. He urgently reported the villagers' mounting anger, prompting him to inquire about his intentions concerning Xiao Ru. Wang Cheng voiced concerns that leaving her be might result in her harm. However, Lian Cheng Yu questioned his unexpected presence and commanded him to return and monitor the situation. He sought permission to retrieve Yi Yun's body, but Yao Mu dismissed the possibility of finding any remains beneath the waterfall. During these conversations, Lian Cheng Yu, in his inner contemplation, acknowledged that Yi Yun didn't hold him responsible for the villagers' demise caused by the medicine concocted alongside him. Meanwhile, Wang Cheng acknowledged his error and expressed his intention to revisit the cultivation fields. 
Lian Cheng Yu then instructed him to remain vigilant throughout the approaching night, awaiting his signal to conduct the exorcism before midnight. Meanwhile, outside Xiao Rou's residence, a female exorcist fervently chanted incantations, beseeching protection from afflictions and malevolent forces. She vocalized concerns about the male members of their family being afflicted. Amid this spiritual practice, a woman from the gathering raised her voice, attributing their misfortunes to the evil chosen by Zheng Yuxian to bring harm to their family and tribe. Urgently, she beckoned the exorcist, Lian Kuihua, to dismantle the protective ward and intensify the purifying ritual by adding more firewood. As her instructions were followed, the woman and several children in the crowd commenced a barrage, hurling sizable stones at Xiao Ru's dwelling. The tumultuous crowd echoed their actions, launching physical attacks and verbal condemnations at her. Terrified, she huddled in a corner of her room, her back pressed against the wall near a window. The din outside escalated, shattering a flower vase within her room, as a stone hurled by one of the villagers found its mark. In her distress, she recalled Yi Yun, the memory serving as a beacon of fear amid the chaos. In the midst of this turmoil, the woman raised her voice again, proclaiming that the moment for action had arrived, and they should set fire to Xiao Ru's house. However, in a sudden turn of events, she was struck on the neck, collapsing unconscious onto the ground. Amid the confusion, Lian Kuihua urgently urged everyone to remain composed, only to collapse herself in mid-speech. Witnessing the sudden falls, fear gripped the onlookers, causing them to hastily retreat from the scene, as if fleeing from a haunted place. Amid a retreat, Wang Cheng found himself trapped by the dispersing crowd, his apprehension heightened by the thought of Xiao Ru escaping. Yet, in an unexpected twist, he was struck on the neck, falling unconscious beside the others. As the crowd retreated, Yi Yun emerged on the scene and commented that, without the presence of Lian Cheng Yu and Yao Yuan, Wang Cheng's fate would have been sealed. Filled with concern for Xiao Ru, he entered the house, finding her huddled in a corner, visibly shaken. As he approached, she trembled with weakness, collapsing onto him. She voiced her fear prompting him to offer reassurance that he would prevent any further harm to her. Despite his promise, she cautioned him to remain vigilant. Suddenly a voice called out for her, and when he turned, he saw his neighbors, Uncle Wang, Aunt Wang, and young Xiao Kei. They inquired about Xiao Ru's safety, to which he replied that she was unharmed, but weary. As the conversation unfolded, Xiao Kei burst into tears, recounting how the crowd wanted to harm Xiao Ru and held animosity towards him. Uncle Wang then asked about his future plans and disclosed their intention to leave the area to avoid further trouble. He also asked them to keep their encounter a secret, as revealing it could lead to harm. Uncle Wang agreed to maintain their silence, yet Xiao Kei's voice tinged with sadness queried whether Yi Yun was returning. In response, he assured her that he would indeed return. Shortly after their departure, their house was engulfed in flames. Yi Yun, cradling Xiao Ru in his lap at a safe distance, watched as their home burned. Overwhelmed with anger, he vowed to find the most effective way to bring about Lian Cheng Yu's demise. In the expansive wilderness, within a treehouse, she awoke from her slumber, instinctively calling out for Yi Yun. However, when his voice responded with a, Finally, you woke up, she questioned whether she was still caught in a dream. Yet as he approached her, his presence dispelled her uncertainty. He reassured her that he had indeed returned. Her joy couldn't be contained as she tightly embraced him, sharing her profound fear during his absence. In response, he earnestly apologized for causing her distress. After a short while, curiosity got the better of her, and she inquired about their location. He divulged that he had erected the treehouse hidden in the depths of the mountains, serving as their refuge. Her astonishment was evident as she marveled at his solitary accomplishment. He explained that his diligent practice had paved the way for the construction, though it had taken him some time. He also added that he would often return late from his practice sessions from that day forward. In response, Xiao Ru conveyed that her primary concern was his well-being, regardless of the circumstances. He reassured her of his safety and promised to prepare a wonderful meal to commemorate the establishment of their new dwelling. Curious, she inquired whether he had crafted the stove as well. He shared an anecdote about accidentally making it with a hit of stone due to his lack of control over his strength and chuckled. Playfully, he prompted her to guess the contents of his bag, but considering the many surprises he had sprung on her before, she opted for a direct answer. He then unzipped the bag, revealing a variety of food items nestled within. Her delight was palpable, as she remarked how he was becoming increasingly unpredictable. His response reassured her that he would always remain the same Yi Yun for her despite any changes. He recounted his encounter with an old man who expressed appreciation for him and bestowed various quality items upon him. Taking up a sharp knife, he invited her to witness a few tricks, deftly slicing vegetables that found their way directly into the cooking pot. She watched the performance with genuine enjoyment. When he eventually served the meal, she likened his cooking skills to acrobatics, playfully asserting that she knew he had mastered martial arts. Aiming for a playful exchange, he encouraged her to try the steamed pork first. As she took the first bite, her eyes lit up with sheer contentment. Inquiring whether it was delectable and reminiscent of a first love, she was taken aback by the flattery.
to which he joyfully confessed his intentions were solely to bring her happiness, promising more culinary delights such as salt-baked chicken, boiled vegetables, and wild greens, they began to eat together, savoring a rare moment of joy after an extended period of challenges. Once they had finished their lunch, Xiao Ru voiced her concerns about the impending task of gathering firewood for the winter and the fear of being discovered. Yi Yun quickly reassured her and promised he had something in store for her. With a knowing smile, he retrieved the Qilin beast from his bag, explaining that they wouldn't require an abundance of firewood because the beast would maintain the warmth within the house. Touched by his thoughtfulness, she said she didn't need to ask for more from him. In a tender moment, she grasped his hand and confessed her worry that he might vanish again while she slept. His response was equally heartfelt, as he assured her he would always look after her, urging her to rest well and find solace in his presence. After a while, Xiao Ru finally drifted into sleep, her peaceful rest bringing a sense of relief to Yi Yun. Observing her rest, he resolved to accelerate his martial arts training for her sake, recognizing the extent of her suffering. Determinedly, he retrieved the book gifted by Lin Xintong, feeling a sense of revelation as he delved into its contents. It became apparent why the old man had cautioned against its acquisition. Lin Xintong had generously shared her complete knowledge, offering detailed insights and commentary that proved invaluable. Closing the book, his eyes shut as he contemplated the teachings. Her notes indicated that the technique could propel him to the pinnacle of the Purple Blood Realm, but its utility diminished beyond that stage. The martial arts journey was akin to challenging the heavens, a pursuit requiring vast resources. Frequent changes in technique could lead to wasted time and energy. While complete faith in the book might result in futile efforts, Lin Xintong's guidance emphasized the importance of integrating the essence of various practices to reach the zenith of martial arts. In an epiphany, Yi Yun realized that the Qilin beast could be a valuable aid in his martial arts training, a realization that dawned not too late. Placing the Qilin beast before him, he resolved not to rush this time. His initial struggles with active control gradually gave way to a more comfortable and relaxed experience as time passed. After a period of focused practice, he rose to his feet, leaving a note for Xiao Ru that he was stepping out to dedicate himself to martial arts training and would return shortly. Outside the shelter, a sense of contentment washed over him as he could now regulate the energy absorption and direct where the energy condensed within his body. Filled with a sense of joy, he set off. Buoyed by the realization, that he finally had enough energy to find a suitable practice spot after a few days of scarcity. After a while, he arrived at his chosen training spot. Standing before a sizable rock, he prepared to train further. In contemplation, he acknowledged that while the complete fist technique was more potent, it demanded greater energy to decipher its profound meaning. It also required an external awareness to be integrated into the movement. As he focused, a surge of energy enveloped him, and he honed his awareness on the final move. His punch struck the rock, causing it to disintegrate into fragments. Taking a moment to catch his breath, he sprawled on the ground. Unexpectedly, the force of the fist technique coursed through him, and his stomach rumbled loudly. As Amethyst began absorbing the ambient energy of the environment, excitement bubbled within him, and he declared his task accomplished. However, a wave of concern washed over him as he remembered his promise to Sister Xiao Ro about returning early. Upon returning home at night, he apologized to her for his delay. However, she had already prepared a meal for him and encouraged him to eat recognizing his likely exhaustion. Following dinner, she couldn't shake her concern for him, fully aware of the significant impact of his exposure to the Qi realm. Meanwhile, outside the house, Yi Yun reflected on the strange occurrences that had unfolded since his unusual encounter with the waterfall. Considering the events of the day, he contemplated his next steps. Initiating a controlled exhalation, he harnessed the energy of heaven and earth, a hallmark of the Qi state. After successfully opening the second meridian of the governor, a martial artists could gradually intake the ambient energy to replenish their strength. However, advancing along this path required mastering the concept of no-self, but he had already comprehended this aspect. With the aid of the amethyst, his surroundings came alive, stars seemingly moving at his mere thought. Proceeding to the final step, he completed it, and in a moment of exertion, he purged impurities in the form of blood. This marked his further tempering. He had now reached the fifth level of the mortal blood realm, the realm of the Qi Gatherer realm. Meanwhile, Anguished cries resounded through the air, their mournful echoes permeating the surroundings. In stark contrast, Lian Cheng Yu's frustration erupted into violent action as he shattered an object in anger. He berated Wang Cheng vehemently, labeling him a failure on two fronts, failing to prevent Xiao Ru's escape and losing control over the villagers. Seizing Wang Cheng by his locket, he delivered a menacing threat, blaming him singularly for the misfortunes. With force, he expelled him from the premises commanding him not to reappear before him unless armed with pertinent information. Following that, Wang Cheng departed, his face bearing the marks of his encounter, and approached the assembled villagers. He commanded them to maintain their silence while they knelt before him, imploring him to secure more of the coveted magic pills. The village men were in dire straits, and they sought the pills as a lifeline. However, 
He seized one villager by his attire, his tone seething with anger as he questioned the worthiness of these villagers to receive such pills, and scolded them for requesting pills to preserve their seemingly insignificant lives. His anger escalated as he berated the entire village for failing to uphold the exorcism ceremony and their inability to locate Yi Yun. Wang Cheng lambasted them for resorting to their families as an excuse, yet despite his outburst, the villagers persisted in pleas for the life-saving pills. His frustration reached a boiling point, and as his hand was poised to strike a villager, a messenger arrived with good news. Whispering the news into his ear, the messenger's words elicited elation, prompting him to personally convey the news to Lian Cheng Yu. Subsequently, as he stepped into his chamber, he was questioned about his presence again. Wang Cheng then conveyed the uplifting news that the desolate bones had been successfully forged ten days ahead of schedule. The news brought elation to Lian Cheng Yu, prompting him to conclude that there was no need to create any disturbances. With ample time remaining before the election, he was confident in his victory. Wang Cheng further proclaimed that under the auspices of young master Tian Wang's blessing, the gods would be unified for millennia to come. Following this, Yao Mu revealed his intention to invite the relics of the desolate bone on behalf of Lian Cheng Yu, urging him to prepare himself and expedite the celebration of the desolate bones. Lian Kuihua, Wang Cheng, and others engaged in vibrant dancing before the stage in the subsequent celebration. The atmosphere was lively as the last cow of the village was ceremonially slaughtered, signifying a significant moment. All eyes were on him as he prepared to make a name for himself. Following this, he entered the scene holding a box in his hands, accompanied by Yao Mu who bore incense sticks. They placed their offerings on the table before them. When he inquired about the nature of the elixir, Yao Mu motioned for him to remain silent. After a brief pause, he declared the ceremony's completion, and Wang Cheng, brimming with excitement, knew that the moment had come. They marked the occasion by launching fireworks into the sky, creating a dazzling display of colors. On the contrary, Yi Yun observed the fireworks with amusement, though he regretted not being able to witness the joke happening in its entirety. He promptly quieted down so as not to disturb Xiao Ru. Approaching her, he noticed she was murmuring in her sleep, expressing a fear of him leaving. He held her close, reassuring her that he was right there and that everything would be all right. Subsequently, she drifted into a peaceful slumber. Meanwhile, as Lian Cheng Yu opened the box, he was taken aback by the appearance of the pill, resembling a clump of mud. Upon consuming the pill, he found himself puzzled by its muddy taste, wondering whether there was a problem or if it was the intended flavor. Undeterred, he remarked that time was of the essence and urged Yao Mu to prepare for his breakthrough. As Lian Cheng Yu retreated to undertake his breakthrough, Wang Cheng issued strict orders to the other guards, prohibiting them from escalating the situation further. He warned that any disturbance to his process would result in severe punishment. In parallel, Yao Mu confided in Yao Yuan, expressing that the Lian family would express gratitude following Lian Cheng Yu's successful breakthrough. In response, Yao Yuan requested that they await the positive outcome. In contrast, Within the confines of his attempt at composure, Lian Cheng Yu recognized the gravity of the situation and the need to exercise caution. He understood the significance of this endeavor, as success would pave the way for his much anticipated revenge. Engaging in controlled breathing, he endeavored to maintain his patience and focus during this pivotal moment. On the other side, Wang Cheng provided detailed instructions to the guards regarding their actions when the appropriate moment arrived. His ingenious plan received accolades from the guards, which evoked a sense of pride in him. Despite this, he urged them to return to their duties and maintain a low profile in their conversations. In contrast, the passage of time outside heightened Lian Cheng Yu's unease. He had always verified the authenticity of the desolate bone along with his subordinates, and the potency of the cold poison was also rumored. However, his expectations were met with disappointment. A mere lump of mud that crumbled upon touch contrasted starkly with the concept of nurturing a jade for a thousand years to pass it down through generations. Frustration filled Lian Cheng Yu as he questioned how he could expect to accomplish significant achievements when he was evidently ill-prepared. Meanwhile outside, the scene was considerably less intense, with the guards and Wang Cheng seemingly battling yawns. Curiosity piqued. Wang Cheng inquired about why the guard delayed organizing Lian Cheng Yu's breakthrough ceremony. The guard explained that they had noticed no signs of movement for hours, which had postponed the ceremony. Hearing this, his anxiety only escalated. Conversely, Within the confines of his frustration, Lian Cheng Yu had resorted to pounding a rock in an effort to vent his emotions. His hands were bleeding, and his trembling form portrayed his deep-seated exasperation. The morning light had arrived, yet he continued to relentlessly strike the rock, causing it to show cracks. His sudden anguished cry led those outside to assume that his blood realm breakthrough had been accomplished, symbolizing unity across the divine wilderness. However, as Yao Yuan and Yao Mu entered the chamber, a different scene greeted them. Lian Cheng Yu was writhing in pain, his body marked with bleeding wounds. Anxious, Yao Mu inquired about his condition, 
prompting him to reveal his failed breakthrough attempt while expressing his intense frustration and self-inflicted injuries. In response, Yao Mu instructed Yao Yuan to keep this development under wraps. Conversely, the distant mountains reverberated with the joyful sounds of Yi Yun. He was immersed in the preparation of his cherished chicken wings, serenading the moment with his singing. A steaming, succulent chicken wing was then presented to Xiao Ro, accompanied by his request for her to patiently await his return. He then energetically leaped out of the window, perched atop a tree, his gaze caught a sight unfolding below, a procession of beasts accompanied by a mounted figure carrying a flag emblazoned with the insignia of a dragon. That was all for this video. If you enjoyed the storyline, make sure to like, subscribe and comment your thoughts down below. We look forward to your accompaniment in our next video.